Welcome to this free ASP.NET course. In this course, you're going to build an entire pizza delivery application using ASP.NET MVC and Entity Framework Core. My name is Dennis Panyuta, and I'm grateful for your attention as well as for the 50,000 subscribers that we have reached on this channel. So if you want to plus one that, hit the subscribe button and also the like button if you feel it's amazing to get this huge amount of content for free. And by the way, this is just a third of the entire course that we are about to launch. You can find the link in the description below to register for the course. And I have some more amazing news. This course wouldn't be possible without my co-instructor, Yannick Leismann, who is also our new content creator for TutorialCU. Hi there, as Dennis already mentioned, my name is Yannick and I'm a professional software engineer, Microsoft certified web developer and content creator now at tutorials.eu. I'm super excited to be part of this channel and to teach you ASP.NET. I would say let's dive right in and get started. Welcome to chapter one. In this chapter, we are going to look at what ASP.NET is. We're going to understand what MVC, Blazor and Razor means and how they are interconnected with each other and how they are connected to ASP.NET, as well as install the right packages in Visual Studio. So in case you're not sure whether you have the packages installed that you will need for the project, I would recommend that you definitely watch that video as well. So let's get started. All right, so let's have a look at ASP.NET Core 6 what it means and where it comes from, those kind of things. So what is ASP.NET Core? Well, it's a cross-platform, high-performance, open-source framework by Microsoft. Yes, it's open source and you can go to GitHub, clone it and contribute to it if you feel like it. It is used for building modern cloud-enabled internet-connected apps. So let's explore a brief evolution of ASP.NET. So it was introduced in 2002 and it started out as ASP.NET, evolving from the version 1.0 to 4.7x, which only supported Windows builds. This was actually a limitation for developers getting into the ecosystem. So ASP.NET Core was then introduced in 2016 to support cross-platform builds and made open source by Microsoft, a move that converted a good number of developers into the Microsoft ecosystem. So why should you choose to learn ASP.NET Core instead of any other web development framework or tech out there? Well, the strengths of ASP.NET Core lie in its ability to develop and run applications across multiple platforms, which makes it more productive and less time consuming. There are components of the framework that make development faster and easier, like the Razor pages, which render components that are reusable and make development easier and faster. The framework being open source means that it will be easier for you to learn from community contributed content. Continuous evolution and support of commonly used tools in the ecosystem are also part of it. So it's supported by Microsoft and they're really working on it and really improving it. So let's dive into developing with ASP.NET Core. We can build web applications, Internet of Things applications, mobile applications and backends across all platforms. All this using our favorite development tools like Visual Studio, cutting across Windows, Linux and macOS. And ASP.NET Core supports deploying applications to both on-premise and cloud servers. So developers can utilize cloud solutions like Azure, AWS or legacy servers running on-premise. Don't forget to check out our ASP.NET 6 full course. In over 13 hours of content, including quizzes and challenges, you will build real-world projects, including handouts and support. We will also dive deep into topics like MVC pattern, Blazor server, RESTful API development, authorization and authentication and entity framework. You will become a true ASP.NET rockstar. So wait no longer and enroll right now. You can find the link in the description below. Before we head into the gist of the course, let us first have a high level understanding of when and why we use the different templates because there are these keywords, Razor, Blazor, MVC, and all of those are basically just templates in Visual Studio. And yeah, let's look at them. There are three approaches to building modern web UIs with ASP.NET Core. We can choose to build applications that render UI from the server. 
or those that render UI on the client in the browser, or those that use both techniques. Of course, there are pros and cons to using each of these approaches. So let's look at it in detail. So now let's talk about the server rendered UI approach first. As the name suggests, the UIs, HTML and CSS are dynamically generated on the server in response to a browser request. The advantages of using this approach is that the client requirements are minimal because the server takes care of the logic and page generation. This is great for building for low-end devices. Users with low bandwidth connections and multiple browser versions will appreciate that. The downside is that it is expensive as the server handles all the work and user interaction is time consuming because every update has to be generated and rendered by the server. This approach is commonly used for static sites. And then we have the client rendered approach. The UI will be dynamically rendered in the client's browser by manipulating the DOM accordingly. DOM stands for Document Object Model, which will allow us to write code that, that can change the document structure, style, and content. The advantage of this approach is that the app is highly interactive as the UI updates are handled locally and it is cheaper as the cost of rendering the UI is offloaded to the client. It also supports building progressive web apps as the offline mode will still provide interactivity. The downside is that it will exclude clients that have low end devices or low bandwidth. And when it comes to load time of the logic, users may experience latency as the code needs to be downloaded onto the client. This approach is commonly used for interactive dashboards or collaborative apps. So when we use the server rendered UI, we can choose between Razor Pages or MVC, which stands for Model View Controller. So let's talk about Razor Pages first. Razor Pages is a page-based model where the UI and business logic are kept separately. It is easier to make UI updates and keep the pages organized. Furthermore, this approach is easy to test and scale. Then we have MVC, the model view controller pattern, separates the app into models, views, and controllers. Controllers are responsible for working with the model to perform user actions. The controller chooses the view to display and provides it with the data required. It supports decoupling of low-level details and for this reason it is great for building scalable large apps. When we use the client rendered UI, we can choose between the Blazor framework or a simple page application with JavaScript for example. Let us talk about Blazor. Blazor apps are built using Razor components. In Blazor, both the client and server code is written in C Sharp. Blazor apps work well with model browsers because Blazor uses open web standards without plugins. We can alternatively create single page applications with JavaScript frameworks like React and Angular. With the popularity of JavaScript, this can be an easier option However, with the evolving JavaScript framework languages, this can be hard to maintain. So we're going to check out Blazor, Razor and MVC in this course. So this was just to give you an idea and an overview of what you can expect. Welcome back. In this video, I would like to quickly show you which tool we're going to use and you can just install it and then move on from there because we need to make sure that you have installed the right packages as well because just installing Visual Studio is not going to be enough and you might be wondering why certain frameworks don't appear in your case. So let's look at that. So first of all, you need to go to visualstudio.microsoft.com slash downloads and then just download the Community 2022 version which will be free or you can obviously decide to use the other ones as well if you want to pay for them, but the community version is for free. So you can either install the Visual Studio with .NET or Visual Studio without .NET, which will be a custom installation where you select any workloads that you want to select. So just download the Visual Studio installer or this setup exe and it will open up the Visual Studio installer. And while well, it says that I cannot open another instance, that's because I have this tool installed already and opened up already. So this Visual Studio installer is basically just a tool that allows you to install Visual Studio and all of its packages. So here in my case, 
you see that I have two versions of Visual Studio installed already, 2022 and 2019. And you can go over to the available options here and then select the one that you want to install. In my case, I installed the community version. So you will find the community version here and you can then install the version directly from here. Now, installing this tool by itself is not going to be enough because you also need to make sure that you modify it. So you go over to modify and then here you need to make sure that the ASP.NET and web development workload is active. So here, check this checkbox and then click on modify and this will then install ASP.NET for you. You will need that in order to get the right frameworks installed for you. Otherwise you will be struggling and they won't appear for you and you might be wondering why that happens. Okay, you can obviously also install individual components from here. Specifically, I'm going to quickly scroll through them if you want to make sure that you have the exact same ones installed as I do. And either way should be fine, however. Okay, so just installing this bigger workload will do the trick. Now click on modify and then install the workloads that you need there. Once the installation process is done, you can uh, launch the application directly from here and this will open up Visual Studio for you. Just to test whether things are working, go to create a new project and then search here for Blazor, for example. Okay, Blazor, there we are. Search for Razor. Razor, there we are, and also search for MVC while you're at it. So here, ASP.NET Core Web App using the Model View Controller. Okay, so that's what we're going to do in the next video. So just make sure that you have those available. If you don't, then you missed to install something in your module. So just go to Modify and then add the workload, this one here. Okay. So see you in the next video. Welcome to the MVC chapter. In this chapter, we're going to dive deeper into what MVC means. We're going to build our first model, view and controller, as well as look at how to create a form and build a form based page. And along the way, you will have a couple of challenges. So let's get started. All right, before we get started using MVC, so the template in Visual Studio, let's have a look at what MVC stands for and how all of this works. All right, so MVC stands for Model View Controller, which is a software design pattern commonly used for developing user interfaces that divide the related program logic into three interconnected elements. And let's look at those interconnected elements here. So we have the model. The model contains the data that is represented by the view. So this would just be classes that we're going to create, data classes, for example, and stuff like that. And then we have the view, also known as the representation, which is responsible for representing the model or the data and handle user interaction. So that's what we can see. And then finally, we have the controller that manages the presentation and the model. Let's take a deeper look at how the MVC patterns work in ASP.NET, for example. So let's imagine the following scenario. You opened your browser and typed a website address. If the website you requested is built using ASP.NET MVC, this is what's going to happen. Your request will be sent to a controller, for example, the home controller. Depending on the logic, the controller might grab some data from the database and use it as a model. The model will represent the data that the user is interested in. It could be combinations of different tables from our database. After that, the model will be passed to a view. The view is what the user will interact with, so the user interface. And the view is going to use the data, which is the model that was passed to it, which is going to be the response that the user will get in return. So additionally, the user might click on a button on the view, for example, which will send another request to another controller and the cycle will repeat. So we're going to build a little application where we use those three components and then this will be a lot clearer and will make a lot more sense. So see you in the next video. All right, so let's get started by building our first ASP.NET Core web app. Therefore, you can just enter ASP and you will find ASP.NET Core Web App as an option here. 
And then we also have the one where it says model view controller. And that is the one that I want to use. I don't want to use that one here and not the empty one. I want to use the one which has models, views and controllers in it already, which makes our life a lot easier. So you see, this is Razor Pages. We're going to see that later on, but we're specifically looking at the MVC aspect of it and the, specifically the MVC template. So here you could call it first MVC app. For example, that would be a fine name and I'm going to select that one. So regarding the version, please make sure to use .NET 6.0, which is a long-term supported. You can see you can also use 5.0 or even 3.1. .NET Core 3.1 was the first bigger core version, which then included everything else. And then they renamed it to just .NET. They didn't call it core anymore. And you see the versioning is all over the place, but now we're at 6.0, which is long-term supported and that's great. So then you can leave everything else as is and click on create. So as you see here, I'm using Visual Assist. That's an extension that I can highly recommend a plugin. I'm going to close that. But what's really interesting for now is going to be that we have now our ASP.NET Core application. And if you look at the Solution Explorer, you will find that there are a bunch of different files here. We're going to go over them later on, but for now, let's just run our application and see what it's going to do for us. So here the SSL certificate is being asked for, and I would like to trust this. So. I'm going to install this certificate so that I can actually run the application. And what will happen is my preferred browser will open up or does open up as you see here. And we have our application with the same name that we gave it when setting up the app. And it's called first MVC app. And you see it has some code in it already from here. So with all of the solution explorer files that we have here. So we have controllers, views and models and those basically generate what you can see here where we have our home page which is this one it's on the local host and then we have the privacy page and in my case well i stopped running the application this is a little bug that i have once i move the application over to a different page let me show you and when if i full screen it or make it full screen then the application stops running so while i'm not I'm opening this window in full screen. You see it's still running. Let's see if it's, yeah, there it is. Once I do run it in full screen, well, now it works, but if you run into this error, this could be the solution for it, okay? So if you run into the error that your browser doesn't open up the application properly. So that's the starting point. Now you know how to set up an MVC application. Let's look at how to create our own um, and C's in the next couple of videos. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to look at the home controller and create our own controller. So first of all, let's look at this class that we have here. So it's the home controller, which is of type controller. So it inherits from the controller class and it has an I logger, which logs and it's a read only variable. Then we have the controller constructor, which initializes the logger. So then what's interesting is that we have actions and those actions are what we have seen on our page as buttons that we can click on, which lead us to views, which lead us to pages. So we have this home action, which sends us to the home page and we have the privacy action, which sends us to the privacy page slash privacy view. So it returns a view in both cases. So one is called an index and the other one privacy. And these functions return an I action result, which defines a contract that represents the result of an action method. So it just returns a view and you will find that under home, there are two views. So the index CS HTML, which is a C sharp HTML file and the privacy CS HTML, which are linked directly to these two functions or methods. And then we have the error action result, which returns an error view model. So here you see there's a little more going on. Basically it just takes care of what should happen if we run into an error, which shows our not found page or something like that. So if we want to know more about 
what is being displayed. We can just open up, for example, the index HTML and here we can find our div, which just says that there is an H1, which displays hello, and then a paragraph which says learn more with the ASP.NET Core link. So if we open up our application, that's exactly what we see here. So welcome, which is this header one, and then the paragraph. Okay, so that was just very quickly to see the connection between what's going on. But now let's actually create our own controller because that's what I said we would do, right? So let's create a Hello World controller. Right click onto your controllers and then add a new controller. So here you can see it allows us to directly add a new controller. I'm going to select the empty controller. There could be read write actions, for example, if you wanted to use them or the entity framework, which we're going to use later on, but we're going to use the empty MVC controller for now. So let's select that. Let's give it a name and I'm going to call this one hello world controller. So hello world controller.cs. What's important is that you use the controller keyword here for your controller classes. This is just a convention and you should definitely use it this way. So MVC controller empty, let's select that. And there we have our own controller that we just created with an index, which returns a view. For now, you can see that we don't have a view. So here we don't have something called hello world under views. We could of course create a new view here and call it hello world and then we could put the HTML index page, C sharp HTML page in there and design it as we want. But we can also just go ahead and return HTML code here directly. And I'm just going to even simplify it. I'm just going to return a string. So this is the index page, for example. All right, super simple. I'm just going to do it like this. Obviously this is not an I action result, which we need to return. So instead, I'm just going to return a string here and suddenly our code is fine. So now let's add another method or action that will return a different string. We will call this action hello. So public string and this one will be hello and return who's there. Okay, so that's what this action should return. And by the way, this should just be a string, not a capital string. So now if we run our application, let's see what we're going to get. Ah, what's up there? We still get the same page. It still says welcome and learn about building apps and so forth. Well, that's because we never said that we should jump to our Hello World controller as default. So let's go over to our program dot cs file and here at the very bottom you will find the pattern where the controller is set to home so controller home and we want to use the hello world controller instead we can also define an action so you see you see it has uses the controller home with the action of index so if you go to the home controller you will find the action index and the home controller is the one that is set by default here. So if we want to replace this, what we need to do is we need to either specifically say which controller we want to use or what we could do is we could also just use a different link. So let's run our app again. And this time let's go over to our hello world controller. And we can see this is the index page. So now we have created our own controller and we can directly go over to this page. As you can see, there's nothing really happening here. It's actually rather boring. This is just a string that is being displayed. So now that's how we got to the index action. How do we get to the hello action? Because you see, by default, it just jumps to the index action. We didn't specify that we want to go to index. It just happened. Now, if you want to go to hello, you will need to go to hello world slash hello. So here, let's enter hello world and then slash hello. And this will now send us to our hello page, so to speak, or hello action. So it just shows this who's there page, which is obviously just a string and super boring. But we're going to see how to add views and modify this in the next video. 
So see you there. All right, now that we know how to create a controller, let's actually create a view and return it instead of just this stupid string that we have here. All right, so let's go over to our views folder here. And inside of it, let's add another folder because I want to follow the same structure here. We have home and now we have hello world. Okay, so the home folder was there before by default. And now we're going to do the same thing with the hello world folder because that's how we called our controller, right? We called it hello world controller. So inside of use, we're going to use the exact same name without the controller keyword assigned to it. And now we just need to create views which have the same name as our actions in here. So for example, the index, I can go ahead and now create a new view here, which will be at the very top when you add a new view. And I'm going to use an empty razor view. So let me select that and call it index CS HTML. CS HTML stands for C sharp HTML, which is just a razor page. Okay, so if you hear the razor keyword, that's what it means. So let's go ahead and add that. And you can see we have this at sign here at the very top, which just says for more information on enabling MVC for empty projects, visit, and then there's the link that we can use. So this is the C sharp code part, so to speak. So we can now use C sharp code as well as HTML code inside of this razor page, inside of this CS HTML file. So here you find it on the right hand side, we have this index and we can go ahead and well display something. So for example, we could display a paragraph saying this is the index page of the hello world controller. Okay, so that's great. And let's add an H1 here while we're at it. And let's say hello world bro. All right. And now Let's save this file. Let's go over to our Hello World controller and now make sure that we actually return an I action result and a view here. So what this will do is it will just use the view that has the same name as this method inside of the folder that has the same name as the controller without the controller keyword. So in this case, it's going to open up our index.cs HTML file when we go to our hello world controller. So let's run this application and go over to the hello world page once again. So here, hello world. And there we are, hello world bro, which is the headline with header one. And this is the index page of the hello world controller. So that's how we can create a view very easily and quickly. And now let's say we wanted to show the hello world controller as the default controller. So here we can just go ahead and say hello world should be run as default. If we don't want to jump over to hello world each time you can see hello world bro is now the default start page, so to speak. So if we go to home, it still works, but now it has to specifically go to the home page. If we just go to the base URL, we will find that we go over to our hello world bro HTML page that we have built. Okay, so that's it for this part. That's how simple it is. Now you could hammer away and create your very own view. You can see this is a very simple HTML code that I'm using. If you are not aware of what HTML is, it stands for hypertext markup language, which is the most basic building block of the web. So it defines the meaning and structure of the web content. And it basically works like that. You have an opening tag, then the content of whatever you want to do, and then the closing tag, which closes the same way, but you have the slash added to it. So this is a header one. There are also header two, header three, and so forth. They each time get smaller and smaller all the way to header six, which is the smallest version. And then we're using a P which stands for paragraph. So this is just a paragraph that we have built. Okay. So that's it for this video. In the next one, we're going to look at, well, first of all, you're going to get a little challenge, but then we're going to look at the model class as well and create our own one. Welcome back. In this lecture, we will learn how to add a model 
that our view can use to display different information based on some logic. So, so far we have seen how to use a view and how to use a controller, but now let's use the models as well. And you can see we're not just using models, we're using view models. We're going to see the difference later on because what a view model does is it's not actually representing our database, it's only a class made to be passed to a view. So a view model can contain only the data a view is going to display. We are only touching on the basics in this chapter and we will cover everything in minute details in future sections. Anyways, now let's add the model to our models folder. So here, right click in there and click on add and then here add a new class. So this class I'm going to call dog view model like so. So this class will have two properties. So prop tab and this one will be name and this will be of type string. So string name and then another property. So you can just enter prop double tab and the other one will be H. So our dog will have a name and an H. Okay, now in order to use this view model inside of my view, I need to pass it via the controller. So the model will not directly talk to the view, it needs to do it via the controllers. So let's jump over to our Hello World controller and set up our dog. So here dog, and let me see, we call it dog view model. Let's create an object from it. And in order to access it, we need to make sure that we have first mvc.models in here as well. So now dog view model, and I'm going to call it doggo, will be a new dog view model object. And this object, I'm going to pass some details to it. So for example, the name should be sif, and the age should be two. Okay, so let me pass those details to my dog view model directly. And now we can pass the doggo to our view. So we have our view model, we have our controller prepared, and we are passing the dog view model to our view. Now the view itself doesn't know about this. So we need to go over to our view and let it know that it should use this model and that it should display the model somehow. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to write C-sharp code inside of my Razor file. So in order to do that, we need to add an at sign. This is to tell the compiler that we are writing C-sharp and not HTML code here. So I'm using the model keyword here, and now I can say which model I want to use. And this one will be, let me see if it offers it directly, no. First MVC app, dot models dot dog view model. Okay, I want to use my dog view model that I just created earlier on inside of my application. So the add model statement at the top of the view file specifies that the type of object that the view expects in our case is the dog view model. Now to access the data that was sent to this view, we will use the model property. The model property is an object of the same type we specified at the top of the page. So in this case, the dog view model. And remember, it's a C-sharp property, so it will be at model.name, for example. So let's display the name of our dog object and its age. So I'm going to just put it in here in header four values. So here, a dog named at model dot name says hello. Now let's see how old the dog is. H4 at model dot name is at model dot age years old. Okay, so this now allows us to directly access our dog's age and name. So now let's run our application and see how this is gonna look like. A dog named Sif says hello. Well, what did I write there? <laughs> Name at named says hello. I think this should be better English. <laughs> 
name is, okay, let's see. Sif is two years old, that's fine. A dog named Sif says hello. All right, so that's pretty much it. So now we pass data from our controller of the model that we created to our view and displayed it inside of the view. Now, this is a very simple example, but you can now use the same principles to make a far more complicated application. Don't forget to check out our ASP.NET 6 full course. In over 13 hours of content, including quizzes and challenges, you will build real-world projects, including handouts and support. We will also dive deep into topics like MVC pattern, Blazor server, RESTful API development, authorization and authentication, and entity framework. You will become a true ASP.NET rockstar. So wait no longer and enroll right now. You can find the link in the description below. So let's extend our current application a little bit. Press Ctrl F5 to start the application and let's take a look at what we have right now. We have our Hello World controller right here, which is called from our program.cs as the starting page. But as soon as we navigate to another page like home or privacy, we are not able to get back, right? In real world applications, you often need to modify the navigation. So let's go ahead and remove home and privacy. And let's just simply add a new site to the navigation here, which says doc. Go to the project and then open up views shared and then layout now let's scroll a little bit down and let me zoom a little bit out right now and as you can see we have two list elements here right li this is for list item ul this is for unordered list so we have an html tag unordered list which is actually the list that you can see in the nav bar like home and privacy and then we have the list items which contain the typical a tag which is nothing else than a simple link Right, so as you can see, we have them right here. Let's remove one of them. Let's get rid of the privacy one. Let's keep the home one and now call it doc, right? So we just rename it. Pretty easy, doc, right? And then we have the ASP controller here. And let's take a look at our program.cs real quick because we already changed something here in our map, map controller route, right? we changed the controller here to our custom hello world controller. This is the page that gets called when we start the application, right? Hello world index action. So let's just copy the hello world here, go to the layout and as a controller, no longer take the home controller, which gets created in the template by default. We take the hello world controller or custom one, right? And that one will lead us to hello world index doc. That's amazing. Also, Please notice that you are able to click on the icon on the top left corner. Let's click on first MVC app. And as you can see, we get directed to the slash home index page, right? So we can see that we also in the navbar right here, we have the a, uh, we have the a tag right here, which is the navbar brand class. So this is just some styling. And as you can see, we also have here the ASP controller home. Let's change that to hello world. ASP action index is still fine. We can give it some other name here like dog app. Ah, there we go. Dog app, right? I just want to show you some nice and sweet uh, stuff that you can use to modify and uh, yeah, customize your own application. Great. So let's take a look what we have now. Press Ctrl 5 in order that you don't have hot reload activated to build the application and host it again. Now let's see what we have. Top left corner we have dog app. Let's click on that. Oh, as you can see, we get to Hello World Bro, right? So this seems to be working. And let's just visit our page again. As you can see, we still get navigated to our Hello World controller. And when we click on Doc or Docs or whatever, we come to that custom page. So now this looks good. For sure, you could also include an icon instead of a text here. Do not call it Doc app. Maybe we have a nice dog icon, right? And now we can even go ahead and extend it a little bit more so that we have another page. One page? is listing all docs and another page is for creating a new doc for example because right now we cannot create anything we just have that in our code hard coded right so we should add another way not only reading data and displaying them in the front end like here right this one gets created in the back end and displayed in the front end 
We also need that the other way around so that we can enter an HTML form and then we submit it and in the back end we receive the information of the form so that we can create a custom doc. Let's go ahead and extend that a little bit. So now go ahead and call this doc list. That's easier to understand. So the A tag is doc list in the navbar. And then we add another one, another list item. Go ahead, copy that one. We will add this to the Hello World controller too, to keep it simple for now, because this is just our first starting application, right? That's just really to get you hooked and to get you started. So ASP controller stays Hello World, ASP action, let's call it create. ASP action create, we don't have that right now, don't get me wrong, but we will create this in a minute. Now let's call this create or create new or create dog or whatever you want to call it. Okay, let's save this. So press Ctrl F5 right now. And when we visit our application and we click on the dog uh, create here, then it will not work because when I go to create, it wants to redirect me to hello world slash create, right? So please notice that route. Hello world is the controller, create is the view. But right now, the only thing that we have, let's check that here, we have the hello world controller, which is here, hello world controller. And here we only have the index action. And we also, when we check the views folder, we only have the index view. So we need to extend the current system so that we also have a create view and a create I action. Let's go ahead public i action result call it create please name it exactly the way that your view file will be named so we will call it uh, create so this is why the method is also called create we can also open just a different view by sending in a different file name but to keep it easy right now we just call it the same name as the view file let's return something because we need to let's return view and since we not provide any data or something else or a custom view name, the only thing that will happen here is he will check, all right, do I have a view in the hello world controller, uh, in, in the hello world folder, sorry, here, hello world folder, which has the same name as the method of the I action result, which is create. And now, right now, we don't have a create view. So let's real quick create one. Move to view, hello world folder. And now let's create a view, right click, add view, call it create, raise a view, add, and then we call it create.cshtml or simply create. He will extend the file ending automatically. Great, now we have that also included. So let's get rid of the standard template right here and let's just simply add an h1 tag and this is simply create just for checking if everything is working right control f5 in order to start the application let's take a look if our navigation is now working so we have a doc list right that's working let's click create and now you can see our header here right so now hopefully you have understood the matching how the routing is working in the mvc pattern so what is happening in detail it's pretty easy we have that create method here and he will check because we don't say something else. We could also say create doc, right? And then he will check for CSHTML file with exactly this name. But since we don't provide anything, he will check which controller am I currently in? Hello world. And what's the method name? Create. So he will move to the views folder, check for the controller name, hello world, and check for the method name, create, and he will display that content. Amazing. Now. Let's move on to the exciting part where we will create a form in order to create a brand new doc and send form data from the view to the controller. So if we want to send some form data to create a new doc, we for sure need a form which we can fill out, right? So let's real quick do this HTML stuff at the beginning. For the current styling, we use Bootstrap. In the Bootstrap, we have a grid, so we have columns, and rows. Typically you start with a row. So let's go ahead, let's create a div, give it a specific styling class, which is row. Create another div inside that row and give it a class and the class name is 
call and then minus six. So 12 is the entire width and you have six as the half of the entire width, so 50%, right? And then you can do three for like 25%, absolutely no problem. Okay, let's go ahead and write that down. And inside of that column, we can now create a form. Let's go ahead and create a form. Later on, we need to add some more information to that form, but for now, it's fine if we simply add another div. And inside of that div, now let's create a label first of all. And that label is simply for the dog name. Give it a class equals to form minus label. Oh, sorry, there we go, form minus label. And right now the text could be dog name, for example. And this is only the label, so only the text. We should also create a new input with the type set to text. And now let's duplicate that entire div. And there we go. So div one, div two, let me just space that a little bit up so that you can see it a little bit better. Dog age. We could for sure simply remove the dog, but that's fine, dog name, dog age. And let's set the input type to number. Awesome, let's save this and let's take a look. Press Ctrl F5 and let's visit our create page. And as you can see, we now have our form right here. Let's give it some nice styling, right? So we have that nice looking label, but the form field does not, re or the input field does not really look nice. And it's a little bit, well, we can stretch it a little, a little bit more. Let's go ahead and for the inputs, let's add another class. And the class is form minus control. We do the same thing for the dog name input, class form minus control. Now let's take a look again. As you can see, it's now split it up in a nicer way, a little bit better. And now I want to show you something in addition. We can also set a card around this. This is a nice bootstrap element. So let's go ahead and build it real quick. So just let me get that out of the keyboard. It's a diff. And inside of that div, we have three other divs, all right? That's important. You will need that very, very often in web development if you continue with Bootstrap. So let's go ahead. You have one div, and inside that div, we have three other divs. The top level div will get the class equals to cart. Now the div beyond, or the next uh, child div, will get cart minus header. The next one will get the class set to cards body. And the next one will get the class set to class equals to card minus footer. So make sure that you have it exactly in the same way as I have. Don't add classes to the end tag for sure, only in the starting tag. So we have one div class card, and then we have three other divs, header, body, footer, right? So now let's take our form. We can simply copy the entire form also for sure, no problem. And let's add it into the card body. Let's save this. If the formatting does not really work, press Ctrl K and D, and then the formatting will get adjusted. That's looking nice now. We can give some header elements here. So inside the div from the card header, let's create an H5, for example. Call it create a new doc. And the card footer, we can leave that empty. That's fine for now. So let's take a look. Controller 5, start the application and move to the create page. All right, as you can see, we now have a nice card element, right? So that's looking already pretty nice. We can add a separator right here at create so that we have some free space. This one is our empty uh, footer. We could also include some information here, but that's fine for now. One more thing to go. Here we have our create. Now let's add an HR, which is just a header or it's a spacing. It's a very thin line. Let's take a look. Yeah, now you can see that spacing here, right? You now have that thin line, which looks pretty nice. Okay, so this is very important because during your web development career, you will really have to create a lot of forms and Bootstrap is very often used. So now you know how to create a nice looking form instead of just some ugly fields lying around there in your page. 
Okay, cool. So now when we enter something, we cannot submit it because we don't have a submit button. And even if we would have a submit button, our form is not so configured that it would send some data to our backend or to our controller. So for now, let's style it a little bit more. We just need to add another button. Let's go ahead in our form. And here where we have the dog age, let's create a new div, the third one. And inside that div, let's add a button. Button, let's call it save. And let's give it some classes to style it. Class equals to btn for button. And then for color, btn minus primary to make it look blue. All right, take a look again. And as you can see, we have that nice save button right now, but we need to add some space. So for every div that we have inside of a form, let's add a new class call it MB margin bottom three. So add some additional space uh, from the bottom of the element. You will see that just in a second. So that every element has a little bit of spacing in between. Now you can see when we take a look, ah, uh, yeah, that's, that's nicely. Now we have some space that's easier to read and we can clearly see our button not being attached directly to the input field, right? So that's fine. Let's say this is enough for now because that already looks better than it did in the beginning. Now let's really take a look on how we can send data from here to our controller because when I enter something, set that Bruno, H is five and I click save, nothing will happen, we just reload the page. All right, so a great starting point, let's take a look on form submission. Now before we configure our form right here, so that we say it will send the data to a specific endpoint in our controller, let's first of all build the endpoint in the controller. So go ahead into the Hello World controller, which is right here. And now don't get confused, this public eye action result returns the view. So inside of that view, we have that form. Now we are in the view, right? We write some information into the form and we click on submit and then we will have to call another action here. Let's give it a good name, public I action result create dog. There we go. And now we will use data binding to say the information from the form, which is like age and name, that will automatically get created a dog view model. Let's call it dog view model, that's fine. In the first scenario, we really want to check only if we get into that method. So simply add a breakpoint in line 22 for me. So this breakpoint will get activated as soon as we click on submit in the form. Now, this is now red underlined because we don't return the next step. We need to do something. We can pretty simply say return view and please go to our index page. So let's say index, okay? So just again, we get to the create page. That one will get called here because we click in the navigation bar on create. We return the view, inside of that view there's the form. Now we fill out the form and click on submit and we will get to create dog. We will then check if we have the dog view model data which we entered in the form. And then we will automatically, without doing anything else, get redirected to the index page. Which is then again the listing of all the dogs that we have currently saved, right? Or that we have currently created. Let's save this for now. This is the create doc. Let's just keep the name and let's move on to the create part here. When we click on the navigation bar, then we get and click on create, then we get to our create CS HTML page, right? There where we have the form. But we need to tell the create page what model is currently used in that page. Because when we enter that create page and fill out the form, we want to create a new doc. So this is why we create a new doc VM, doc view model equals to new doc view model. Sorry, doc view model. There we go. Because we want to add a new doc. So we don't fill out any information. We simply give a new clean doc uh, view model into that create page. And then we can use that clean view model to fill it out by the form and then send it back into the create doc right here. Now, don't forget to take the doc view model here and put it inside the view. Now, this step is very important. This is data binding. Let's go into our view, right? So right before we open up our create page, we create a new doc view model, send it in. 
Now let's go to our create page and let's add the model right here so that we can make use of it in our view. Add model. Add model is dog view model. This is very important, right? You don't have to give it a name, just call the class. This has to be matched with the same thing that you just paste here. Dog VM is type of dog view model. So in the create HTML or CS HTML, we have to use the model dog view model. Now we can make use of it. If it's empty or not, doesn't really matter. Now you can use the model. This is simple data binding. Paste it from the controller into the view and from the view into the controller. This is how it's working, right? Now we can make use of the model. I show you how in a second. First of all, let's create our form to send the information to the correct endpoint. Let's go ahead, configure it. ASP minus controller equals to hello world because our controller, which has the endpoint, which is here, create dog, right? That's what we want to call. This is inside the hello world controller. So let's write down ASP controller hello world. Now we have to define the action, ASP action. So let's take a look. What's the name of the action? The action is create dog. Let's copy that, paste it inside, create dog. Now when we create elements on the server, this is typically a method called post. So let's create a method of type post. You can get data and you can post data. Getting data is for reading, posting data is for creating. Great, okay, so now the form is configured. Let's give the button a specific type and the type is submit. A button of type submit submits a form. Now one thing that we need to adjust is we need to say that the input text here, that this one is bound to the dog name in the view model and that this H here is bound to the dog view model H field, right? So let's take a uh, look real quick into models dog view model. So we have name and age. We need to really combine them so that this input field or those input fields are really matching exactly those two elements. And now we can do that by using the dog view model, by using a simple keyword in our input here. Let's say ASP minus four. This is really, really important. Now we can bind that, right? That's this data binding again. And we bind it to, as you can see, name, all right? Why can we do that? Because we have the dog view model right here. If we don't have it, we cannot make use of it. Let me just remove it real quick. You will see this is underlined. All right, so let's do this real quick with the H again, ASP minus four. So this input field is for the H. Okay, just read it as it is. This input field is for the name, ASP for the name. And this input field is for H. We just need to add that ASP because this is how it gets spelled. Great, this is really, really nice. Now let's go ahead, take a look at our Hello World controller. We have that breakpoint. So don't press Control F5, simply really start the debugger using F10 or simply click the green button. What we wanna see, we want to see that breakpoint firing in the moment we submit the form. Now let's click on save and see if it works. And as you can see, yeah, we just got into that breakpoint. Let's take a look at dog view model and you can see Bruno and H5. So we have our information sent from a view into our controller. And this is a very important way of sending information in an MVC pattern, right? So you give that data into a view and inside of that view, you can take the data for example, create something new and send it back to the controller. So this I action result method here, this one is displaying the form and this one here gets called when we submit the form because we simply bound it, right? Inside of that form tag, we say, hey, please send the data to create doc. And the object relational mapper, the ORM will automatically bind this into a doc view model C-sharp class. That's extremely powerful. 
Okay, so that's pretty nice. At the current point, we don't do anything with the dog view model, but we already received it. So we have our information of our new dog here. So now we need to take a look on how we can save it. We don't have a database right now. That's totally fine. Later on in other projects, we for sure will use databases, but for now we can really keep it easy. But let's just take a look on how we can save our dog, which we have just created, so that we can really see the results of our final first application. So I just removed the breakpoint and started the application using Hot Reload. And if we're here in our form and I click on save, you will run into an issue where it says, hey, in the index sees HTML, I cannot see or reference at model name. That's pretty easy to fix. And I really want to point out what exactly here is happening, right? So let's go into our project. As you can see, when we in the index page, which is here, we are loading a dog view model into the view. This is why it's working when we're just visiting the start page. Because our index view is referencing right here our model. So if the model here is null, we will for sure get an error. So we have multiple ways to fix this. We could simply say, hey, if the model a null, then we can do something else, etc. But that's not the point we want to do. I want to show you something else instead, which is pretty handy and saves you some time, depending really on what you want to build. The issue is coming because we send uh, submit the form. We say Bruno is five, five years old, for example, and then we return the view index sees HTML, right? And this one will just open up the index sees HTML and the model will be null. So we get the error right here because we don't have a model. We don't have a, sh have a dog to show because we don't submit any dog right here. Let's instead of returning the view, let's use a very common way to solve this. Let's redirect the user. Oh, let me just comment that out. I don't want to remove it right now because I really want to let you see the difference. So this is what we did before. And now instead of returning the view, we redirect to an action, redirect to an action, for example, name of index. So this is working now. What does that mean? So instead of returning the direct CSHTML page or view, which will throw an error because we don't have a dog, we simply redirect to this method here, which will then create the doggo sif h2 and return the view index with the doggo, right? So this is what it's doing. This one returns the CSHTML and this one redirects to this action, which then calls this syntax or this code here. Later in this lesson, we will adjust that code. But for now, that's a fix, right? So let's go ahead, let's try it out. Press Ctrl F5. Let's try to submit a form again. And you will see, we will then get back to the index page, seeing Sif H2. For sure, our currently saved doc, which we entered into the form, will still not be visible, but that's next up. Let's go ahead and click on Create. Enter some doc name and an age, and let's click on Save. And now you can see, hey, we get back to our page, which is working. So we get redirected to the index page. And again, we are seeing the model that just got created in the index page. So what we now need to do, instead of here always creating a new dog view model, we should have a small list or something like this just during runtime where we save our docs to and then reload from there, right? Because right now we don't have a database, but however, we need to save our elements at least during runtime of the current application or during the session. Let's go ahead and do that real quick. So don't care about this too much because later on we will use a database, but just for you to show what we can really build with our two views, like our index view and our create view. Go ahead, private list of type dog view model dogs equals to new list. There we go. Now we have an empty list. And instead of here loading the index page and create a new dog view model, we can simply return that list. But now pay attention. We return that list. But before this was a single dog, so one. But now we have many. So let's go ahead into our index here's HTML and change the model here from a dog view model to a list. Very, very important because now we have a list and that changes everything. 
as you can see this is now underlined but we can write a loop right so we do this for for many elements for example instead of saying hello and years old let's create a very very simple list now write at for each var doc in model right and model is all list so this is why we can use a for each loop here and now let's just remove this and now we can make use of a list so let's simply create a ul it's an unordered list let's copy that for each inside and inside of that for each we will now loop through the model and create list elements for each doc so let's create an li list element or list item and let's simply say add doc dot name and then we add some braces add doc dot h there we go go back to our hello world controller and when we create a doc here this is our doc view model we simply add it to the list right so docs dot add doc view model so this is really simple we just have a short list then start our application and check if everything is working as you can see we don't have anything right now that's totally fine we don't have a list because we have not created any doc let's click on create so let's create our first doc and you will notice then when we click on save we will still not see the element but why is this let's go to our application this is really easy to adjust now this is how it works by design this is not a static variable so for every session this variable will get instance as a new element and a new element here is new list with zero elements so the moment we call create doc and add that doc that's fine and afterwards we get redirected to the index page and docs will be null again so let's make that static to avoid it so that the new list here the docs list is a little bit more persistent and doesn't need an instance of the controller because this is how static works Great, now controller 5 and everything should work now. As soon as we start the application, the list, however, will always be null because we don't save it persistently. So every time you shut down the application and start it again, for sure the list will be null. So this is why I said later on we will add database, but for now this is just a so-called in-memory database. However, just an abstract version of it, it's just saving elements during the runtime, right? Let's go and hit create, enter a doc. Let's click on save and now you can see Bruno five years old, right? Let's create a new doc. Let's call it Malika two years old. Let's click on save and as you can see Bruno Malika two, right? So now this is working when we restart the application, this will be gone. But now you should have learned a very, very important principle of ASP.NET Core MVC, which is actually loading data. So sending data into a view and creating data from a view into the controller. So due to a form, for example, right? You fill out a form, you send the data to a controller, and then you can save the data to a database, or as now we just added it to a static list. So by now, you should have a brief understanding of how ASP.NET Core is working in terms of the MVC pattern. Amazing, so let's move on to the next part of this course. Welcome to the Razor Pages chapter. In this chapter, we're going to focus on the user interface and therefore we're going to build a pizza delivery application in Razor Pages. And once we're done with the user interface, Yannick is going to take over. In order to save our pizza orders, we will add the basics of Entity Framework Core to our brand new Razor Pages application. So let's get started. So what are Razor Pages? Well, simply put, Razor Pages is a simplified and easier to use page based web application programming model that focuses on using a file based routing approach, eliminating much of the workload that ASP.NET MVC introduced. This also keeps UI and business logic separated, but still within the same page. Razor Pages is the recommended way to create new page based or form based apps for developers new to ASP.NET Core. Razor Pages provides a more accessible starting point than ASP.NET Core MVC. It benefits in addition to the server rendering benefits of quickly building and updating the UI. The code for the page is kept with the page while keeping UI and business logic concerns separate. It's testable and scalable to large apps. You keep ASP.NET Core pages organized in a more straightforward 
way than in ASP.NET MVC. View specific logic and view models can be kept together in their namespace and directory. And groups of related pages can be kept in their namespace and directory. So each Razor Pages record found under the pages index equates to an endpoint. Razor Pages have a related C -sharp document called the page model, which holds each page's behavior. Additionally, each page works on the limited semantics of HTML, just supporting get and post methods. So Razor Pages makes use of the popular C -sharp programming language for server-side programming and the easy to learn Razor templating syntax for embedding C -sharp in HTML markup to generate content for browsers dynamically and cross-platform server-side HTML generation. So how are we going to use this for our understanding of this chapter? By building a pizzeria website. In the next video, let's get a quick overview of what we're going to build in this chapter. All right, so what are we gonna build with Razor Pages? Well, the project is going to consist of a simple pizza shop website entirely handled by Razor. Just as a disclaimer, in this example, we're not going to be working with actual databases since this is not within the scope of this chapter, but we're going to work with a simplified fake version of a database from which we can use the logic to easily implement one further on. So as a quick overview, what's the website going to teach us? Well, starting with the basic Razor Pages syntax and page layout, we are going to be building our page from the ground up using their initial template and file structuring to get ourselves a simple page working. Learning how a Razor project is layered and where we can find all the parts of our future pizza shop. After that, we're going to get our selling page done with a simple logic to get all of our pizzas displayed as well as make your own option with its own form. This will need a pizza model as well as an initial fake database to populate our pre-made list of pizzas. Then we're going to learn how to bind and send data from a post in the case of our make your own option and from a simple link using ASP root and how to use and calculate our final order to then finish it off on the thank you page. So that'll include everything from simple project file structures all the way to I action results and routing. So let's start with the setup. All right, so let's get started setting up our project. Therefore, in Visual Studio, in my case 2022, I'm going to create a new project and here I'm going to use ASP.NET Core Web App, which is the one with the example ASP.NET Razor Pages content. So make sure to use that, double click or click next and then give it the name. I'm going to call this one Razor Pizzeria. Then click next and here I'm going to use .NET 6 for long-term support and then just click on create. Once the project is loaded, you will see the screen here with the overview where we can look at the SP.NET Core documentation, the .NET applications architecture and so forth. But what I want to do straight away is to test my application. So I'm going to click on run here at the top running our Razor Pizzeria application. This will open up a tab in your browser, actually a new window in your browser. And you can directly see we have our Razor Pizzeria. In my case, the port for the local host is 7257. In your case, it will be a different number. And here you can directly see the website that was automatically generated for us. So this is the home page, then the privacy page, even though there's one thing to consider. So in my case, you can see the site can't be reached. That is because when I go on full screen mode and drag this window from one screen to another, because I'm using two screens, I run into this problem as you see here. Okay, so I need to run the application again. If I keep it in windowed mode, then it's fine. As soon as I go into full screen, it can lead to my application being closed. Okay, so that's something you need to be aware of. But now you see it works flawlessly and yeah, you can 
open up here the documentation with this beautiful little link and you can go to your home page to the privacy page well these are all the pages that we have at this point potentially you could get this kind of warning which is a security warning you are about to install a certificate from a certification authority claiming to represent local host and so forth so you can then click on OK, don't worry about it. And this will then allow you to run your application inside of your browser. And yeah, that's the starting point. Now we have our project. Now it's time to make changes to it. So we're going to do that step by step in the next couple of lectures. So see you there. When creating our project, you can see that it is very similar to what we have seen in, in the MBC example. It is different, however, because we don't have the view model as well as controllers. We do have the pages, however, as you can see. So for example, our error page, the index page, and the privacy pages, each of them are C-sharp HTML files. So these are our Razor files, and we can go ahead and make changes to them very easily. So if we go over to our index file, for example, you can see that this is the content of it. So we have the view data, which sets the title to home page. And then we display this HTML code here, which contains a container with diff. And then we have the header, which says welcome, which follows a certain class, which is inside of CSS. So defined inside of CSS, how this welcome is going to be displayed. And then we have a paragraph which says learn about with a link to the documentation for ASP.NET Core. So that's what this A and href does for us. So building web apps with ASP.NET Core, closing it with the A tag as well as the closing P tag. So these Razor pages that we have here are being used alongside supporting files, which are shown as file names with an underscore, such as view imports and view start, CSHTML. But not only that, also inside of the shared folder, we have the layout and validation scripts partial C -sharp HTML files. The layout CSHTML file is there to contain the content that repeats on each page on the website, like the main menu, the footer, or other elements. For both to work together, the Razor page is injected into the underscore layout file through a C-sharp render body line, which you will find here a little further down where we have the class container with the main content using the add render body. So this is where it then will render the body depending on which page we're at. So for example, the index page or the privacy page. And then we have the footer underneath. So you see the header takes all of this space here. Then we have the actual content of the page as well as the footer. Then we also have the www root folder, which contains our CSS. So the code that defines how certain parts of the website are going to be treated. So how certain classes, for example, are defined. So here we say we have the general font size of 14 pixels, but then inside of the add media class, we are using a font size of, size of 16 when there's a minimum width of 768 pixels and so forth. So this root folder helps us to add all the additional files that are going to be located in here. Okay, so for example, that's where we would put in our images and our static HTML files, like JavaScript files and CSS files. So this GAS stands for JavaScript. So here is defined in JavaScript, what we would do in the website. So what should happen on the client side, for example, if we want to overwrite that in JavaScript, which we're not going to do. So as I said, inside of www root, that's where you would add a folder, which you're gonna use for images. So let me just set that up and also drag the images in there that I want to use. You will find these files assigned to the lecture and you can download them from there. And then once you have extracted them, you can just drag them into your images folder, like so. And there you are, we have our pizzas, as well as the pizza time JPEG.
All right, now let's go ahead and use one of those images and I'm going to use it inside of my index file. So here you can see inside of the index file, we had our paragraph and now I'm just going to add an image in here, which will use the class of main image and we'll have the source of a tilde. So here you use the tilde operator in order to access the www root folder in which you then find the images as well as the pizza time JPEG file. And you need to close the image tag here. If you now run the application, you will find that the pizza time image is being displayed just underneath the learn about paragraph here. All right. And then what else do we have here? Well, we have the app settings JSON file, which contains the configuration data, like connection strings for your database, for example. But we're not going to use it, at least in this chapter. And then we have our program CS file, which is used to, for example, add services to the container or configure the HTTP request pipeline. So that's a little overview of the files that we have in here. And in the next video, we are going to lay out the pages. All right, so what will the project look like? What will we build in the next project? Well, the project we're going to build is going to be divided into the following pages. Starting at the home page, we will have a link either in the body or the navigation bar to the pizza sales page. From there, you can either select the pizza and directly move to the checkout page or select the custom pizza option, which will redirect you to a pizza form. On the checkout page, the final price is calculated with the pizza name and a final confirm order button will send you to the thank you page. So this means we will be needing a pizza sales page, a custom pizza form page, a checkout page and a thank you page. So let's go ahead and set them up one by one. All right, so let's get started. And the first thing that I'm going to set up is a new folder here for my page that I'm going to call forms and then one for checkout. Okay. So let's add another one here, new folder, check out like so. And then let's set up a new pizza sales page. So here inside of pages, add new razor page, an empty one is what I'm going to select here and I'm going to call it pizza. So now inside of the checkout folder, I'm going to add another razor page. So here, this one will be our checkout. And then let's create another one in there. And this one will be our thank you page. So here, thank you like so. And then inside of our forms, that's where I'm going to create another page, which will take care of our custom pizza. So let's add that page and call this one custom pizza, like so. Now let's set up the pizza page to be accessible from the navigation bar. So in the layout file, which you can find under your shared folder, there we have this list with navigation items. So here you can see we have the navigation item called home and then the one for privacy. So that's where I want to add one to my pizzas. So here, let's go ahead and actually add it in between. And this one will be a nav item, which will just go over to pizza, to the page pizza, which is this page here that we created. And it's going to say pizzas like so. Okay, so now what we can do is we can check whether our whole flow works. So whether our page flow, where we go from one page to another works. I'm going to copy this pizza's link here. So this A class nav link, and I'm gonna go over to my pizza HTML file, and I'm going to add that here. So it should allow me to go to custom pizza which will be the name of the page that I'm going to use here. And it's also going to be the ASP page. So custom pizzas 
Where is that? Where is the custom pizza page? Do you recall? Well, it's over here inside of forms, right? So we need to add that here. We need to say inside of forms, there is this custom pizza page. That's where I would like you to jump. Now let's add another entry here. And therefore I'm gonna copy this line, go to end and add another one. And the second one should go to checkout. So here, checkout. And now how do we get to the checkout page? Well, by going to checkout slash checkout because that's where our checkout page itself is. So this CS HTML page. We just had this checkout folder where we would put everything that is related to checkout. So now on our pizza page, we should be able to jump to those two. So to custom pizza and checkout. Now let's see inside of our custom pizza, CS HTML, how to jump to the checkout page from here. So once we have created our custom pizza, so let me copy this line here and put it in here. So now we have this A again, we are jumping to the ASP page called checkout checkout and we call it checkout. And then in the checkout page itself, that's where I'm going to add a link to our thank you page. So let me add that here, but it's not going to be checkout, checkout, but checkout, thank you. And we can just say thank you here. So thank you, like so. So the text here could be anything we want. I'm just gonna call it thank you as our internal name is. All right, so now let's run our application and see if it's going to work properly for us. So there we are. We have our application, let me downsize it a little. So here we can go to pizzas and this is the pizzas page, right? Because that's how we designed it. We didn't add much to it, but here we had two links, one saying custom pizza, the other one saying checkout. So let's go to custom pizza. In custom pizza, we had nothing but this link. So that's what we have here. And from there we can go over to checkout and actually, let me see, checkouts only shows me checkout. So what am I missing? I go to checkout, thank you. So it stays on custom pizza. It doesn't go over to checkout. So what is missing? Let's see. So here, well, actually the code itself is fine. It's just that for some reason on my page, it didn't want to work. But yeah, now it seems to work. I just reran the application. And now you see, I can go from checkout to thank you. And while on thank you, I have nothing. So for now, there's nothing to show. So that's pretty much it. So we're on a thank you page now. And we see our flow going from one page to the other works flawlessly. So now let's go ahead and actually set up such a page. All right, so let's start with the home page. Since the home page will not have anything special to it, we can use this opportunity to get some bootstrap basics in. And just to be clear, this chapter is only going to cover the very basics and the very basic understanding of styling. We will go more in depth in a later chapter. So this is how I envision the home page to look like. Very simple, right? And well, we only have what the ASP template gave us so far. So let's look at what we have as of now on our welcome page. And there we just have this image, right? Of our boy, Peter Parker, delivering pizza as Spider-Man. That sounds pretty awesome. So if we look at our welcome page, which is here under index. That's where I had this image, which was my main image with the source images pizza time. So it was inside of images here. And then we had this pizza time JPEG, which we display here as the image underneath there. So what I would like to change, however, is the overall appearance. Therefore, we need to make a couple of changes. We need to change the title. We need to change a little subtitle here. So this paragraph could be something different. And then, yeah, we can just go from there. So what I would start with is, first of all, this H1. So this title that we have inside of our class. So here, I'm going to say, welcome to Razor Sharp 
pizzas because that's what our name will be so the company of our name and then underneath i'm not even going to put a paragraph i'm just directly going to use another header so these are the different header types that we have, h1, h2, and so forth. It goes all the way to h6, each of them being less relevant or important and smaller in terms of size, so in terms of text size. So here, what I'm just going to do is I'm going to add a text here saying razor sharp pizzas is the pizza for you and me. Okay, so that will be the header text underneath our welcome to razor sharp pizzas header text you see there is this class called display four that is directly assigned to it now you can go over to your libraries here inside of www root bootstrap this and then there's the css folder which contains this bootstrap css file so this is where the styling happens where the CSS styling happens. So if you search for display four, you will find that these are the settings that Bootstrap has set up for a display four class. So whenever we use this class, you can see that it's going to set the font size to be, well, a result of a calculation, then the font weight to be 300, which just makes it thicker, and then the line height to 1.2, which just makes sure that there is a certain distance between the content of lines. So that's what this setting here does for us. And now we could of course overwrite that, but it would be better for us to overwrite it in our own CSS file, which we have over here. So site CSS. So if we have anything that we want to design specifically for our page, we could do that here but it's really recommended to use the bootstrap default as much as possible, unless obviously you need to make some drastic changes and you're not happy with any of the classes that it offers you. So you, you, so you see here, there's display four, display five, and so forth, different settings that will change the size of your image. So here, for example, display two is gonna do this, but then for media, if the min width is at least 1200 pixels, then it's going to set the font size to be 4.5 rem. So on top of that for our display two class. Okay, so that's just a general idea of what's happening. And we can use these classes as we do here. We use the class display four. We also use the class text center, which who guessed it, will center the text inside of this entire div. So it's going to try to put everything inside of it into the center. And then we have our image. And then underneath the image, I would like to have a line break. So I'm going to achieve that by using the BR tag. And then I'm going to add a link here, which will send me directly to the thank you page from here. So we could of course type everything manually, but I'm just going to get this one here, copy it, and then put it into my URL here saying it's gonna go over to check out and thank you for now. We just want to have a link there and we're going to change everything so that it's gonna look a lot better later on, but it should say something like get me that pizza or bring me that pizza maybe, bring me that pizza, okay? Okay, now if we test this and we go to our home page, which we will get to by default, this is what we're getting, right? So welcome to Razor Sharp Pizzas. This is the header two. And then we have this bring me that pizza, which is a link, but it's not styled at all. And we have the image in between. So if I click on this, you see it sends me to the thank you page. So the URL or the button, so to speak, works. And then we have our beautiful image here, but we can obviously design this better. And for that, we can use classes. So as you've seen, we use this class already called display four, and we can add other classes here as well. So I can go ahead and capitalize this text by using the text capitalize class. So you see, now I'm using two classes, one called display four, then there's an empty space in between, and then I use 
the second class, which is called text capitalized. And what I'm going to also make sure is the text is going to be very black. Okay, so text black. So what that will do is it will capitalize the letter. So this T will be a capital T, for example, and the text will not be this dark, super dark gray, but it will be actual black. So let's check it out. And this is what we get. So you can see here, this T is now capitalized as well as well the rest was capitalized by our default with the text that i wrote but it's also darker right it's more black so to speak and this is just how you force that it's black so by default it might not be black but you're forcing it to be black even if you it wasn't by default so now let's make sure that the link that we have at the bottom this nav link is not going to be actually considered a link but more like a button so what we can do is we can make it the button and then I'm going to use MT1. Now, if you're uncertain about any value that I'm using here, you can just go here to MT1. What it does is it adds a margin towards the top of 0 0.25 rem. Okay, now you might wonder what is this rem that we are using here? Well, you can just search for rem bootstrap and then it will say, rem stands for rootum it is a relative unit of css and translated by the browser to pixels which is the px value when rem is used on the font size in the root element it represents its initial value if we set the font size to 16 pixels of the root html element then the font size of the paragraph will be one rem so one rem stands for 16 pixels so to speak and in our case this will then be four pixels so to speak Okay, so now I'm saying I want to have this button, which will be the button primary. So we can again go to Bootstrap and search for button primary and it will give it a certain background color as well as the border color. Now, if you're wondering what this color is, you can also just search for this color. So just search for this RGB value and then it will show you that it's this blue value. Okay, so basically we're saying go ahead and use this color for the background and for the border for our A tags that we're using. So here we're using this A tag, which uses now these classes. And I'm going to make this a button as well. So just BTN, not the button primary keyword. So if we just search for BTN, we will find that it will get all of these properties. So here, this is the BTN class. It will have a font weight of 400, line height 1.5, a certain color, text align, and so forth. Okay, so you see that there is a certain color already defined and also a background color defined. However, we are overwriting it by using our button primary keyword as well. So by the button primary color here. And yeah, that's pretty much how we can use all of these beautiful classes. So you can see by just using the name, an empty space, then the second class and so forth. So we saw how our application looked before. Now let's see how our get me that pizza is or bring me that pizza is going to look like. And you see that it is this button here at the bottom, which says bring me that pizza and it is blue. And once we hover over it, you see that the color is changing as well. And this change comes again from bootstrap from this hover here, which will then change the background color to this color here. So the border color is this time a different one than the background color. So you can again, just go ahead and enter this color in here, get some info. And you see that it is now a slightly darker blue than the one we had before. So here, this is the one that we had before, and this is the darker blue version. Okay, so that's what's happening here. Now, that's pretty much it for this page, I'd say. Now, you can obviously find these things out by using the Bootstrap CSS file. But what's even better is if you directly go to the Bootstrap documentation. And you can find it under getbootstrap.com docs 
getting started, introduction, well, that's where the documentation is and you can find all of the details of what's up here. So you can also search for things like BTN and then you will find the button tags and it says button, button primary. So these are the different buttons that we have. So we can do it with a, an A, so with an anchor, we can do it with a button, with an input and so forth. So these are just styles, so to speak, that allow an item to behave in a certain manner. So if you wanted to use outline buttons, you could use the button outline primary, for example, or secondary or success, danger and so forth. So these are just some examples of classes that you can use and suddenly your buttons behave very differently, even though we are using anchors. Now let's say we want to style something individually. So we want to set up our own style. And as I told you, then you would have to set it up in your site CSS file. So here, what I'm going to do is underneath this body, I'm going to add another class that I'm going to call main text. So this is my own CSS class now. It's not the same as classes in programming languages, but what it just does is it allows us to use the style that we're defining here for any given item inside of our HTML. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to say, I want to have a bit of padding of 75 pixels in one direction and 20 pixels in the other direction. And then I need to add the semicolon. So what that will do now is it will add 75 pixels of padding towards the top and the bottom and 20 pixels of padding towards the left and the right. In case you were wondering what padding is, this is the padding. So let's say this is the text that we have. Welcome to Razor Sharp Pizzas. And then I want to have padding outside or for this div that the text is in. Then I would use the padding keyword to create this green area. Then the div border is this red border and the margin is this orange area that you have around it. Okay, so if you want to adjust the margin, that's what we would have to do. So here, instead of using the padding keyword, you would use the margin keyword, even though I don't want to do that. So from now, I'm just going to add this padding to my main text. Now, the main text itself is now a class. So in order to use this class, I'm just going to go over here and I'm just going to make sure that my div here that I have, which I want to contain my two header tags, so I need to create a new div here with the class of main text, like so. And in there, that's where I can now put everything that needs to be surrounded by this padding or it needs to have the internal padding, so to speak. So now the H1 and H2 will have a big padding. Now let's check it out real quick to see whether the changes were applied. And you can see now we have a distance towards the top, the bottom, and well, left and right, even though we don't really see that because we have plenty of space in those two directions. So that's what we just did. We created our very first own CSS class and also used it to style our application. Now, what if we want to achieve this result that you can see here, where the image is rounded and then the subtitle that we have which is down here, is also styled slightly differently. Well, let's set it up manually. Therefore, we will need to have some additional classes. So let's create a new class here, which I'm going to call main image. And I'm going to add a border radius, which creates this effect where we have a rounded image. Then I'm going to add a filter which allows me to use something called to drop shadow which will drop a shadow where I can define in which directions I want to have a shadow. So I'm going to have 10 pixels of a shadow towards the bottom right and then I'm going to set the RGBA 0, 0, 0, 0,0,0,0,3. What that will do is it will make it slightly transparent. So that's what I want to achieve for this. Now I just need to also close this bracket, otherwise I will run into issues and close with a semicolon. And then I'm gonna have a margin of 40 pixels as well, which will create a border surrounding the image. 
Okay, so if we now use this for our main image, let's really quickly do that, where our main image is gonna, well, it already has this class. So now let's run it and we will see that I get the shadow as well as rounded corners for my image and the margin as well. Now I'm going to just design real quickly my main subtitle. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set the font weight to 400 and the letter spacing to two pixels. And now let's use the main subtitle in our index page here for the header two, where I'm going to set the main subtitle class. So now we will have a very distinct spacing. There we are. So distinct spacing between the individual letters. Okay, so that was it for this video. We looked into Bootstrap. We looked into how to create our own styles in the site CSS, how the Bootstrap CSS looks like and how we can design our application using existing classes and also creating our own classes in CSS that we can then use in HTML to well, style our website. So see you in the next video where we're going to set up the sales page. Don't forget to check out our ASP.NET 6 full course. In over 13 hours of content, including quizzes and challenges, you will build real-world projects, including handouts and support. We will also dive deep into topics like MVC pattern, Blazor server, RESTful API development, authorization and authentication and entity framework. You will become a true ASP.NET rockstar. So wait no longer and enroll right now. You can find the link in the description below. All right, so now that you have a certain idea of how CSS works and how you can style with Bootstrap, let's build this little page here. Now you can obviously try to build this yourself. What you will need is to set up the background for a given div. So you need to create your own div here. And in that div, you would then put in your image as well as this text and this button here underneath and of obviously also the background. And then here you need to set up three divs next to each other. So this will maybe be a little more tricky, but overall, let's go ahead and build this. You can obviously pause the video and try to build this yourself. Okay, so let's go ahead. So therefore, let's first of all, go over to our sales page, which will be our pizza page. So in here for now, we only have those two links and we can actually get rid of them. We're not gonna need them for now, even though we will need a link later on, but we're gonna build it once we need it. So in here, I'm just gonna get started with a div using the class text center. So I want to make sure that the text is centered again. And then inside of this div, I'm going to have another class that I'm going to call main text. So the one that we created ourselves in the last video. And then I'm gonna have a header one, which is gonna use the class of, well, actually the same things that we have used in our index HTML. So let me just copy this here over to my pizza. We don't need to write everything from scratch again. We're not going to need this H2. We will need H4s, however. But yeah, let me get rid of that as well. So now we have our H1 with the capitalized class and text black. And the content that I want to have in there will be our great selection of pizzas. And underneath, I'm going to have some text. So I'm going to use H4s here. So let me put that in here. Choose one or try our pizza builder, then order and done, which will be an H4 tag. So a very small header tag, so to speak, okay. Then another one, which says no need to give any of your details and we already know everything. <laughs> so yeah, pretty deep information here. So then I'm going to add a very tiny little text 
So let me show you what I mean. I will eat this only one pizza per order. Okay, so if we want to achieve that, we can use a paragraph here where we use italic text, only one pizza per order. So now let's style this p tag here with the class called small text. And therefore we need to add an, an equal sign as well as the quotations surrounding the small text. So the class that we are using. So now the small text doesn't exist. So we need to design our own class for the small text. So let me just create that. And I'm going to say that the text should align to the right as well as that the color should be gray. That will already do the trick. We don't need to do much more than that. Now, if we check it out, this is what we get. Our great selection of pizzas, choose one and so forth. And then here only one pizza per order on the right hand side. Okay. All right, so now the next thing that I want to have is going to be a container that will be still inside this div class text center. But this container will actually have the class name container. So it should be treated like a container from Bootstrap. So if you look at Bootstrap, containers are the most basic layout element in Bootstrap and are required when using our default grid system. So I want to be able to use the grid system where we have items in a grid, displayed in a grid, and that's why I'm going to use it. So let's go ahead and use the container class. Then I want to create a row in here. So I'm going to use the row class. So there's this class called row. And then inside of this row, I'm going to say that I want to use the 12 columns that are made available to my div. So here this div is going to have the class of column 12 and MB5 as well as MT5. So now if you're wondering about any of those, go over to Bootstrap, look at MB5, for example, M stands for margin and B stands for bottom. So MB will stand for margin bottom, for example. So I want to have a margin bottom five value where five, well, you can see that here, four classes that set the margin or padding to spacer times three. So quite a bit of margin and margin towards the top of five is also what I want. So that's what I'm saying here basically for this div. So now the idea is that we can create our own pizzas, right? We want to be able to click on it and create designs, so to speak, our own pizzas. And therefore I'm going to make sure that my div here will only take a certain width. So I'm gonna set W to 100, this will be a row, this will be well, I'm going to call this one make your own div. Okay, we want to be able to create div, so to speak. And then inside of it, I'm going to have another class or another div, which will have the class of call four. So this will take four columns. So in total, this thing will take all 12 columns, right? And now we want to create something which will take four columns. So in Bootstrap, you have a total width of 12 columns. So 12 elements that you can put next to each other. And we're going to say, we want to use four out of 12. So a third for this div class called four. And for now, I'm going to set an image here, which will be of the, well, which will have the source. And here we need to, need to use the tilde sign it comes from images inside of images we have the pizzas folder and there we have the create png and i'm going to say that it should use the class w 400 uh, 100 as well so w minus 100 okay so this is going to be our image and then underneath this class which takes four columns i'm going to use set another div which will have a class of the other eight columns so this should take the other two-thirds of space so here class with the call of eight 
and I want to align items in the center. So in here, I'm going to say that the div class should be align middle and here I'm going to make I my own text. So I make your own, and this will be the text. And now inside of this div, and I know this is a little tedious, but no worries, we're gonna get there in a bit. It will be all making sense. For now, we just need to set stuff up. So I'm going to align the text to the left. So this is an example of how you can use, and uh, this should be text align, how you can use CSS code in line. So you don't need to create an extra class for this. You can directly do it in line here. So where I'm going to create your own pizza will be the text. So this will be the header three, which will say create your own pizza and it will be aligning towards the left. And then I'm going to set up a paragraph, which I'm also going to style manually. So I'm gonna say style text align to the left as well. So this will align the text and the line content text minus align colon left and a semicolon inside of the brackets. So here make your own pizza with our pizza maker. And then finally, we need to have link that we click on. So here I'm going to use this link that I'm going to give the button class as well as the button primary. That directly gave me the button primary even though I just wanted to have the button there. I'm going to style it so that it floats towards the left. So here float towards the left and then we need to, well if we look at our URLs here ASP area and ASP page. So what do we want to display in there? And that was here. So the ASP area will be an empty point for now. And the ASP page will be our form. And it will send the user to the custom pizza page. So we have this custom pizza, this one here, that's what's going to send the user. And it should say try now. Now you might wonder, what is this make your own div and make your own text? Well, it's two designs that we're going to create ourselves. So two classes, make your own div. So we call one of them. And what's really important is that the text is exactly the same. So if we have any typo in there or whatever, it will not work. So oh, this was this one here, make your own div and then let's style it. So what I'm going to say is, I want to set the background to be gray, right? As we have seen earlier in the image. And I want to have no margin. So I'm gonna set the margin to be zero. And then make your own text. It's going to be another class. Make your own text, which will have a margin of 100 pixels towards the top zero towards the right, 20 towards the bottom, and zero towards the left. So you can see that here, the IDE helps you. It says margin top, right, bottom, left. So in that order, this will be the margin towards the top, this one to the right, to the bottom, and to the left. And then finally, I'm going to set the text to be white. Okay. So now if we run our application here and go over to pizzas, that's what we're going to get. So our great selection of pizzas. Choose one or try our pizza builder. So now we have our pizza image here. This is the big div with the gray background. We're creating our own pizza. We are making our own pizza with our pizza maker by clicking on try now. So this will send the user to the form which we don't have yet. So that's the idea at least, right? So if we look at our pizza, this is this class button primary, which sends the user to the custom pizza CSHTML form. And actually it should be forms. So that's probably why the link didn't work. 
So that's something you can always check whether the link is correct. Let's see, uh, go over to pizzas, try now. And we're on the custom pizza form, which for now is boringly empty because it just has this thank you or checkout button. Okay, so that was pretty much our pizza for now. Now in the next video, we're going to set up the form which will allow us to generate pizzas. But therefore, first of all, we need to set up what a pizza even is and what it's made of. So see you in the next video. Welcome back. In the last video, we set up our website where we now see the pizza and we want to be able to add pizzas, right? Individual pizzas. So in order to add pizzas, we need to think about our data model that we want to use. And when we're thinking about the data model, then we're talking about models. And in general, we need to think about the architecture that we want to use. So we are going to use the MVVM architecture for this project. And in order to use it, we need to understand what MVVM is and what it stands for and why even use it. So we have the MVVM, which stands for model view, view model, which is a software architectural pattern which helps us to separate the presentation of our website so that our UI, so the view, is separated from the development of our business logic or the backend logic, so the model. Making our front end completely independent from any specific model platform. So here, for example, the view will talk to the view model, which then via data binding will send it back to our view, which will basically display something. And then we have our model, which is the business logic and data, and it gets information from the view model, which is the presentation logic, and the model then updates the view model accordingly. So basically, we're not directly talking between the view and the model, we're always talking via the view model. Okay, so in MVVM, we got a model, a view, and the view model. For now, we worked only on views and view models. For our next step, what we'll need is the model itself, from which we can get the necessary data to build our pizzas and calculate final prices, as well as set up our fake database. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so now let's go ahead and set up a model. Therefore, let's go ahead and create a new folder on the top level of our application here. So I'm going to call this one model. Well, you could also actually call it models, plural, if you wanted to, because we also have pages, plurals, right? So we're only going to have one model for now, but that doesn't have to hold us back. So the model that I'm going to create is going to be pizza S. I'm going to use plural because of a certain <laughs> certain uh, difficulty that we have. So why am I using plural? Because usually the convention is that you should use your model names as sing, uh, singular values. So it would be pizza or pizza model, and it would not be pizza's model. I'm going to explain that to you real quick because the problem is, so if I create something called pizza model, we also have the pizza view here, and it has a code behind file which in fact is called pizza model. So we didn't create that ourselves. It was just automatically created for us. So the pizza page has now this pizza model, which is a page model. So now that means for us, we have to use a different name for our pizza model. So we call it pizza's model, okay? So what we can now define here are all of the properties that we want to define. So what are properties that we need for a pizza? Well, I would say the image that we're using, then the name of the pizza, the base price, maybe the final price as well. And then all of the ingredients maybe as, as uh, Boolean. Okay. So let me just use a property here or create one, which will be of type string. And I'm going to call this one image title. So now you see, this is a little trick. If you didn't know yet, you can use the prop keyword here or the code snippet and use the tab key twice and then you will create this beautiful little property. So then here, this will be the pizza name and then I'm going to have a price. So here, let me add another prop, which will be a float. And this will be the base price, which I'm also going to directly define as two by default. So it will be set to two. 
and you see the IDE thinks if we have base price, then we should also have price. Well, actually, I'm going to start off with all of the bullions, such as, for example, do I want to have tomato sauce on the pizza? Then the next one would be, do I want to have cheese on the pizza? Because it could be that you are uh, intolerant for lactose and you wouldn't want to have cheese on it. Or maybe you want a different type of cheese, but then a bullion wouldn't work and so forth, right? So we could now go ahead, obviously, and add all of the properties that we want, like pepperoni, and then having all kinds of food on it. So I'm going to, or ingredients on it, I'm going to just paste them in here. For example, I'm gonna have mushrooms, tuna, pineapple, ham, and beef. And then finally, I'm going to have a float final price, all right? So this will then be my final price for the entire pizza once the pizza is fully created. Okay, so that is going to be our pizza model. And now let's go ahead and use our custom view model where we're going to set up this pizza. Therefore, I'm gonna go over to my custom pizza CSHTML CS file. So in the code behind, that's where I can now create a public, well, actually this will also be a property, which will be of type pizzas model. And this will be the pizza. So now if you try to do it this way, it will directly create a pizza model item, even though I want to have pizzas model because that's the class name that we used, right? So if you want to be able to use that, you need to make sure that you add a namespace here. So where is it? It's inside of our own project here, right? Now you can obviously just show the potential fixes and add this using Razor Pizzeria models folder to your namespaces. And then we can use the pizza. So that'll create a successful reference to our pizza model we created earlier. Now to be able to access whatever we have here in our form view, we need to use binding. So here I'm going to use data binding by using the binding property keyword here. Okay, so this is an attribute that we're assigning that can specify a model name or type of Microsoft ASP.NET Core MVC model binding to use for binding the associated property. So now we're going to bind the pizza model to our custom pizza model page model or view model, so to speak. Now this will allow us to access pizzas or create pizzas from our custom pizza view. So let's do that in the next video. Welcome back. Now let's take care of our view, which is our custom pizza CSHTML. So basically you see we have this model that we created. Then we have our view model, which is this code behind. And then we are using our view in order to set everything up so that we can see something, right? So this is the communication between those three items or three files is gonna happen for us automatically. So now let's go ahead and adjust our custom pizza. So what I want to have in here is just going to be a div, which will make sure that the text is centered. So text and the center version here, text center, and this will also be a container that I'm gonna create. So inside of this container, I'm gonna have a header, and this header is just gonna say, create your own pizza. And then underneath, I'm going to have a form. So a form allows me to enter something, so the user to enter something once they are on this view. So the form has a couple of properties that we can assign. So the one that I want to assign is the method one. So there are multiple different methods that we can choose from. The most common ones are post and get. So in our case, we're going to use the post method because we want to post the details that we have entered in our form over to the website so that it then sends the user to the next page where you can then pay or something like that. Okay, so we're going to send them to the checkout page, okay? So in order to do that, we need to set up our form. 
So we need to have a button which allows the user to submit whatever the user has entered. So I'm going to create a button here, which I'm going to give a, a couple of classes here. So it will be a button primary styled button. And I'm going to also add a margin at, towards the top of a, a little bit. So this is this empty one. And then this button can have a, another property assigned to it, which is called type. And here I can say that this button should be of type submit. So whenever we hit this button, the form will be submitted. So we will be sent to a different page by default. So that's the normal behavior, so to speak. And now let's give this button a text. I'm going to call this order my pizza. Now we need to add a couple of inputs in here. So there is this input, which can be of different types. So for example, the type can be well, you can see here, it could be a button, a checkbox, a date, time, an image, and so forth. So a bunch of different input types are available. For example, if you want a user to enter his password, then we would use the password input type and so forth. But I just want the user to be able to enter text because I want him to give the pizza a name. So I'm going to add the type text here. And then we're going to use this ASP4 keyword where we can now, and it jumps to form, I wanted to use ASP4, there we are, which allows me to say for which property I want this text to be assigned to. So basically what I'm gonna say is, I want to assign this text that the user is entering into this form to the pizza name, which is of type of from our pizza. So where is this pizza name coming from? Well, we need to jump to our custom pizza model, which is just here in the back. You see, it's this code behind. And this is our custom pizza model, which itself has this pizza's model, which we call pizza. So now we are accessing this pizza and this pizza, if we look at it, is, well, as of type pizza's model, which has this pizza name property assigned to it. So what we're doing is we're saying whatever the user enters into the custom pizza CS HTML form here at this point will be assigned to the name of the pizza. So to the object that we have just created. So now we can also call or add a placeholder here. I'm just going to say, give your pizza a name dot, 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 for example. Okay. So this will help the user to understand what he or she needs to do with this input. So I'm going to close this input tag directly. So we don't need to have a closing tag, but just this slash uh, before that. So this will be one form. So actually, let's run this and see what this form will do for us. And let's see. So let's go over to pizzas. And we click on try now and try now sends us to our custom pizza page, right? And here it says, create your own pizza. And here it says, give your pizza a name. So I'm going to say, let's call this one tutorials EU pizza. Okay. And I'm going to click on this and obviously nothing happens, but this is what we have created so far. So this is the input field, the text form. And well, the entire thing is the form and this here submits. So you see, it tries to submit. So the website tries to load something else, but we didn't say where it should go to and where it should send this information to. But obviously we want to have some more fields available. Actually, we want to have a input field for all of those. So we want the user to give the option to set a price. We want to give the user the option to set whether he wants tomato sauce, cheese, pepperoni, mushrooms, and so forth. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to create another input field underneath, which will be of type checkbox, because this is going to be something that you can activate or deactivate. And that's exactly what the checkbox does. And it also stores data in a Boolean, which is perfect because all of our properties were Booleans. And now this will be ASP4. And for which property should that, should that be? Well, this one will be for tomato sauce. Okay, so I'm going to use the same structure that I used before. And the placeholder here will just be tomato sauce so that the user knows what I'm even entering there. Now I'm going to add tomato sauce as a text here as well. 
and then have a line break. So here I BR like this. This will create a line break. Okay, so this will be the placeholder as well as the text itself will be tomato sauce like this. Okay, so now please go ahead and add all of the items that we had here. So all of the booleans, add them into your view as an input checkbox as well. All right, so I hope you tried it. So basically you can just copy and paste this and then replace the details. For example, replace this from tomato sauce to what was the pizza model? The next step in our pizza model, pizza's model was cheese. Okay, so here you would replace this with cheese and then you would change the placeholder to cheese as well, as well as this text to cheese. So this is one way of doing it. Obviously you could type it manually as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the other ones here as well, pasting them in from our prepared code. So you can see we have the pepperonis, we have the ham, mushroom, tuna, beef, and pineapple. And each of them is a checkbox and the placeholder is just the name of the property as well as the text that we're adding there before the line break is going to do the same thing. Okay, so now this is going to be our form. So in order to make it look a little better, it will not be insane, but just a little better, what we can do is we can add some classes here to our form. Because currently, let me actually get rid of this class before, and let's run this, and let's see how ugly it's gonna look like. So let's try, or bring me that pizza. And well, we're on the, on the thank you page directly. So here, on the pizzas, try now, you see this is what it currently looks like. It's not great, but mm, let's make it a little better at least. Not significantly though. <laughs> but yeah, let's change this form. We're going to make it better later on. So here I'm going to send the margin X to auto. And then I'm gonna use margin top five, margin bottom five, pixel five, or PX, then PT five, as well as I make it rounded, five, and I'm gonna have a light background and make sure that this will take four columns. So pretty long entry here, like this. So this is these are going to be the classes that I'm gonna use. And now let's run it again, and you will see what this will do for us. So here we go to pizzas, we try now. And actually, this is how it's going to look like. So here you see we have this gray background. And then actually, let me add a line break after the give your pizza name. So here, let's add a line break in there as well. Okay. So let's rerun this. Because it automatically gave me alert light or whatever, even though I wanted to have back BG light. So let's go over to pizzas. Let's click on the try now and there we are. So we have this grayish background and then we can order the pizza. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Actually, let me add one more padding bottom of five as well, because otherwise it's not going to be very nice at the bottom as you saw it was directly cut in. Okay. So if you're wondering about any of those, right, you know how to find them out. Just use the documentation of Bootstrap. Okay, now if we run this and we actually enter some pizza details here. So let's say we want to have tomato sauce, pepperoni, and we call it tutorials EU pizza. And we click on order my pizza. You see nothing happens, even though internally something does happen, but we're not catching what happens. So there is this method called on post and we can get the data from it. Specifically, we're going to use the I action result on post, and then we can use this form result to calculate the final price for our custom pizza, and then finally send it over to the checkout page on a redirect to page. Let's see how that works in the next video. Welcome back. 
Now that we have the view, the view model and so forth, let's actually take care of redirections in .NET 6. So for this next step, we'll need to get into the view model again. So to our custom pizza CS HTML. And here we'll first create a new flow property, which we will be using to store our final calculated price before sending it out. So here let's create the property, which we're going to call float pizza price like so. Now, after the on get function here, I'm going to create a public I action result on post. So for now on post will show an error since there is no return value specified. Remember that this isn't a void method. This is an I action result method, or at least that's what it should return. So a return value has to be specified. We will get to that in a moment. First, let's learn a bit about I action result. So what is I action result? Simply put, the I action result type is a base abstraction of an action result. It specifies how a response is going to be given for a specific request. To quote the official documentation, the I action result return type is appropriate when multiple action result return types are possible in an action. So we can understand I action result as being some sort of a container for action results. More so knowing that I action result is an interface while action results themselves are abstract classes. So action result return types can represent various HTTP status codes. So let's look at those status codes. What are these HTTP status codes? Well, you probably know this one, the arrow 404, which stands for file not found. That means that the thing that you requested was not found. Well, that's about it, but for a whole lot of scenarios. So let's look at the, some of the most common ones. So to learn a bit about the HTTP status codes, they are categorized and you can see we can find the 100, 200, 300, 400 and 500 type codes. So 1xx codes or the 100 codes are just informative, like saying that the server has received the request and is continuing to process. Then we have the 200 codes or the 2xx codes, which mean that the request was successful and the browser has received the expected information. Then we have the 3xx codes that are for redirection. So you have been redirected and the completion of the request requires further action. And then we have the 400 codes, which are client error codes, like the 404 being an object not found. The website or the page could not be reached. Either the page is unavailable or the request contains bad syntax. And then we have the 500 codes or 5FX codes, which are server errors. While the request appeared to be valid, the server could not complete the request. All right, that'll make us more familiar with requests and results. Let's look at how we can work with this in our project. So now that you're familiar with that, with the action results, let's continue. So on post is there to catch and use anything submitted with the post method, for example. So that's exactly what we're using, right? And here actually it should be on post with a capital O. And if you recall, that's exactly what we're doing here, right? We were using this post method here for our form. And then once the submit button, which submits the entire form, has the type submit, that's where the form actually is being then submitted. And this post method is called, this on post method. So the I action result is the return type of this method. That is what is usually used in on posts. Since you usually want to do some sort of action after the submission, like for example, change to a different page site or just refresh this page to clean out this form. The I action result allows different HTTP statuses to be returned, while action result can return only predefined responses for returning a view or a resource. With I action result, we can return a response or error as well. Nice. So now inside the on post method, let's use our submitted values to calculate the price of our custom pizza. 
Like we have seen before, one of the pizza model properties was base price, which was set to two, representing the minimum price no matter what, and it always has to be two. To respect that, let's start by setting our pizza price to be base price. So here, our pizza price, which is the property, you can see there is this property in custom pizza model, pizza price, and we're going to set that to be pizza dot base price. So that's what we start with. And then after this, let's add a value to it depending on what Boolean properties were checked. So the simplest and most straightforward way as well as the most easy one is the read way. So we need to just go ahead and add a bunch of if statements here. So we just say if pizza dot tomato sauce, then the pizza price should be incremented by one. So here plus equal one. This will just increment it by one. So then the next if statement here, if pizza dot cheese, then pizza price plus equal one and so forth. Now you could obviously change the prices here. So for every single pizza, you could change the value to your liking. So here, some people say that a pineapple has nothing to do on a pizza, which is why the, the price for the pineapple will be significantly more expensive. So people will be shocked if they order a pizza with pineapple, <laughs> even though uh, I, I really don't care. But some people, <laughs> there is a, a meme war about this whole pizza with pineapple stuff. So yeah, we're going to follow it by adding a significant price here. So that'll cover it. And now for the long awaited solution to our still standing error that we have here, this return value error, we will be using a response that will be of type redirect to page. So there is this redirect to page you can see. It's, well, let's actually look at this class after I call it or this method. So here we can say to which page we want to go and I'm gonna say go over to the checkout folder and inside of the checkout folder, you will find the checkout view and that's where you should send us. So let's redirect to that particular page. By the way, you will see that if you hover over redirect to page, that there are multiple different overloads. So you can see even a total of seven different overloads here, or actually seven more overloads. So there are different approaches to pass data or different things that you can pass to redirect to page. So we can even add some details here, and that's what we should do because the checkout needs to have some details, right? So we can just add, you see here, where first we have the page and then we can add an object to it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a new object here and pass it using the new keyword and curly brackets. And I'm going to use the pizza name and the pizza price to be sent over. So this creates an object that just has these two details. It has the pizza name and pizza price, like so. So the pizza name comes from our pizza object here. And the pizza price is the floating point value that we have inside of this class, which is why we don't need to use pizza.pizza price because it is already inside of this particular class that we're currently in. Now, this curly or this square brackets was a little too much. Now, if we save this and run our application, once we click on the submit button, we will see something interesting happen. So let's do that. Let's go over to our pizzas. Let's click on try now. Let's give this pizza a name. Okay, let's add tomato and cheese. So it will just be a margarita. And let's click on order now. And you will see that we actually got to a different page. So we're at the checkout page and on the checkout page we just had this link to the thank you page but the interesting thing is the url so you can see we are on the checkout slash checkout page and then we have this question mark which now has a bunch of values assigned to it so basically we're passing additional information here to the url by sending this post request and using the redirect to page with additional information so we're saying we want to pass in the pizza name as tutorials EU pizza and the pizza price as being four. So that's pretty much what we're passing. And now this page could go ahead and use this data in order to display something. All right, 
So that's it for this video. Now you see how you can redirect data and how you can use the I action result on post method. Don't forget to check out our ASP.NET 6 full course. In over 13 hours of content, including quizzes and challenges, you will build real-world projects, including handouts and support. We will also dive deep into topics like MVC pattern, Blazor server, RESTful API development, authorization and authentication and entity framework. You will become a true ASP.NET rockstar. So wait no longer and enroll right now. You can find the link in the description below. Welcome back. In this video, we will need to see what happens on the checkout page because we sent a post to the checkout page, but now the checkout page needs to get that data and do something with it and display it accordingly. So let's go over to our checkout page and specifically, to the checkout model, which is inside of the checkout CSHTML, which is this code behind, right? So here we have this on get, that's where we can get data. But for now, let's set up a couple of properties here because we need to know, for example, the pizza name. So here, pizza name. Then we need to know the price. So here, property, and this one will be pizza price. And actually, this is the name of it, the property name, but of type, it will be the float value here. And then we need to have another property, which will be a string of type image title, because I also want to be able to send over the image title and then accordingly display the right image. Because as you know, inside of our www root, we have this images and pizzas folder where we have all of those different pizzas, right? And we'll later on give the user to the option to select the right image for their pizza that they have created. So now, since all three of them have to be bind property, we could bind property all of them. So we could go ahead and add this bind property here to every single one of them. But we could also just go ahead and set bind properties for the entire class. So here, you can go over to the class level and here it will be plural because we're binding multiple properties. So we're just saying bind all of those properties so that they will be accessible in the view and will be bound to the view, so to speak. Okay, because we want to directly bind, for example, the pizza name to a view item that we're going to create later on. Since we want to opt into model binding to page model properties on get requests, we need to add supports get to it. So here we will get the data, right? And we get it on the checkout page. We get it from the custom pizza page, but here we need to define that it will support get specifically. So we say get is supported. So supports get to true. So great, now let's make sure that we cover the possibilities of not receiving a name or image title. So we have yet to send that in. We'll cover that in the next step. But to do that, check if pizza name is null or white space. And if true, set the default value say, and the same thing for our image. So inside of the on get here, we can now go ahead and check for those individual items. So we can just check the string is null or white space pizza name. And I love how the IDE just knows what I want to do. And then in that case, we're going to set the pizza name to custom, like so. And actually it's the string, so we need to use the quotations here. And then we have another if check. So here, if string is null or white space for our image title, then we're going to set the image title to create. So here, create. And create is actually a pizza name. So here there's this create PNG, this one here. Then it will be this image that will be used. All right. So we're just saying if we don't have those, then override them with what we have defined as the default for the pizza name as, the, as well as the image title. 
Okay, so for now, let's make sure that we have something that we can display on the checkout page. So we get the code now, we're fine with that, even though we're not using it yet. But let's go over to our checkout code, the view code, and define the view. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have something like your order. So whatever the order of the user is. And then I'm going to add a div here, which will be of class align content center like this. And then inside of it, I'm going to have another div, which will have the class of being three columns wide. So here call three and the MX should be automatically defined. So the margin and I want to have specifically margin bottom of five. Okay, so this will be the div in which I'm going to put, for example, the image, which will have the class of W100. So this will have a certain width, the image. And I'm going to use ASP append version set to true. So this append version true will make sure that the user doesn't have to refresh the page uh, when we make changes, for example, to the CSS or to the image itself and so forth. So this will be automatically managed for us then. Then I'm going to have a paragraph in here, which is just going to say your order for the pizza is ready. Then another paragraph, total purchase price, or total price for your order is colon, and then the actual price after a line break. Okay, so here, I'm just going to also add a link, which will have the button, button primary classes assigned to it, primary, and will have a margin towards the top and otherwise automatically margin it. The ASP area will be an empty string and the ASP page that we want to go to is going to be the thank you page. So here, thank you page, which is in the same folder. It's in the checkout folder. So we don't need to actually add like this checkout folder name in here with a slash. And what I want to actually have as content here will be confirm order. So when the user clicks on it, that's where I want to send him to the thank you page and I want him to confirm the order this way. So if we run this now and we get to this view, so we need to order a pizza yeah, try now, customize it and like this. And you see here your order, your order for the pizza is ready. Total price for your order is and then confirm order, which should send us to a different page, but it doesn't do, do that yet. Okay, now how do we actually customize this page based on properties from our model? And more specifically, what we get from our view model here. Well, inside of our view model, inside of checkout, you can see we have the pizza name, the pizza price, and the image title. So how do we get those? Well, we can just use the head model annotation. So here, your order for the pizza, and here we need to add the name. So here, for example, add model dot pizza name is ready. Whatever name we gave the pizza is going to now appear here. Pizza is ready. And then we also need to do the same thing with the price. So please try that. Pause the video and think about what you would enter here. Okay, so it's at model dot pizza price. And here, not model binder attribute, but model dot pizza price, like so. So now let's try it again and see if the data is actually reflected here. So we go over to pizzas, we try now, we add some stuff to it, order my pizza, and you see your order for the tutorials EU pizza is, well, pizza pizza is ready. <laughs> Total price for your order is five. Now, maybe we should add 
dollars or euros or something like that. So here I'm going to add the euro sign, add euros. Now, how are we going to get the image? Because you see, we have this image, but it never is actually assigned. So there's no actual image being displayed. So in order to get the pizza, we need to make a little change. So here, underneath our order, what we can do is we can add some C sharp code using the end annotation. And we're going to get the photo path or the image path, you could call it. Let's call it var image path from our folder of images, pizzas, and I think it's called pizzas with the capital letter. So here the pizzas folder is with a capital letter, so really important here. And then we're going to say it comes from our add model dot image title and this actually should not be, wait a second, so this is where the string ends. This is where the title goes on, plus, and here we have the .png keyword, like so. And this .png keyword should be like this. All right, so this will now be our image path. Now let's use this image path inside of our image here because the image doesn't have a source yet. So it doesn't know what image to display. So now we're going to add that here by using the add image path, which will use this variable here. All right, now let's check it out again. Let's run our application and see if we're gonna get the pizza to display. So here, try now cheese, tomato sauce, all of the good stuff, order my pizza. And this is what your, oh, this is the image, as you see, your order for the Dororo's U pizza is ready. All right. So since we specified that if no image is sent, that the name will be create, you can also see that you just use this create PNG image here that we have this file. So in this test example of our checkout page that we made, we just use our imagination and we pretend like the confirm order button just covers all the payment system and directly sends you to a thank you page. Since covering this is not the scope of this chapter, let's just send the user to a thank you page and jump to the last part of this chapter. So in the HTML given before, we already specified the URL of the thank you page over here. And actually I called it not thank you page, let me see. I called it thank you. So this page keyword was too much. So now this will send us to our thank you CSHTML. And here, let's just add an H1 where we're going to thank the buyer. So thank you for ordering with us at Razor Sharp Pizzas. So now let's run it again and we should be done. So we have our running application. So try now tutorials pizza, check it out, order my pizza, confirm order, and then we see the thank you page. So now we have covered everything from HTML, CSS to bootstrap, then looking at MVVM, looking at the post, on post method, uh, I action result, property binding, on get, redirecting with overloading, and some smaller treats along the way. To finish this Razor chapter off, let's work a bit with databases. So let's try to make some already prepared pizzas to choose from. In other words, let's make a mock database. All right, for this final step, we'll set up our fake database and finish this up with sending the data we need over ASP route. So let's go ahead and start by creating a view in our pizza sales page. So here inside of pizza, here at the bottom, we had all of these div tags, right? So this button primary, then we had one, two, three, four. And after the fourth one, I'm going to create another div tag. So that just means that it's going to be inside of this div tag here, inside of this row div tag. So I'm going to add a class to it and it should be inside of here. So the class should be call for MB5. So 
just a little bit of margin at the bottom and it should be four columns thick. And then I'm gonna have a image here with a source SRC, which for now will be empty. And let's also say that this image will have a width of 100. So at least whatever this 100 means, it depends on the size of scre the screen and so forth. And then I'm going to use the, well, set the ASP append version to true as well. Let's just make sure that everything is up to date really quickly. So this will be our image. And then let's create a link here, which will be of type button. So we can just click on it and it sends us over to the checkout page. So button primary and it will be empty one. And you see, for some reason, it just wants to automatically use something else. And then we're going to use the ASP area of empty and the ASP page that we want to send the user to of checkout. So it's inside of the checkout folder and there's this checkout file. And here is a text that we want to display. We could say something like get this pizza, get this pizza, like so. All right, then Underneath it, I'm just gonna have a little line break like this. So this will only give us a very simple result. So if you run this, we will just see that under our pizzas, we now have this get this pizza and then you see there's nothing like this image isn't even being displayed because it doesn't have a source yet. So it's pretty empty, right? So we're going to change that obviously based on our fake database that we're gonna make. So we need to set up a mock database and get the values to then loop over the existing pizzas and create a view for each one of them. So let's start with the database. In this case, we're going to just set it up in the view model itself. So inside of pizza CSHTML. Inside this view model, we will add a public list of pizza model and call it fake pizza DB, for example. So let's just do that real quick here public list of, and not publish, but public <laughs> list of pizza models or pizzas model. And we're gonna call it fake pizza DB. So the idea is that you can then later on replace this. Now pizza models doesn't exist, so we need to use this namespace for pizza models to be accepted here. So now this is our pizza model. And now inside, we can put all of our pizzas in there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to assign a new list of pizza models and pizzas model to be precise, not pizza model, but pizzas model, which I'm going to manually now create in here. So here I can just go ahead and create a new pizza model with the following details. So image title will be, for example, Margarita and the pizza name will be also Margarita. Margarita. Then we need to set the base price. And this will not be inside of a string, but here base price to be, for example, two. As well as set the tomato sauce to true and the cheese to true. And then finally set the final price to four. Okay, so this will just be our pizza model for one pizza margarita item or pizzas model. So we're going to create a couple of pizzas models now. So you can obviously just go ahead and do it manually using all of the ones that we have here. So carbonara, bolognese, Hawaiian, Margarita, we already have, Meat Feast, and so forth. So I'm just going to do that here, always separating them with a comma. Okay, so this was the first pizza model, and now I'm just going to create the other ones. And I'm not going to type it in manually because I really don't want to bore you. You can decide yourself which pizzas you want to put in there. 
So then you see the final price is always manually calculated, but obviously you could also run a small method here to calculate it. But we're gonna keep it simple. All right, so that's going to be our fake pizza database, which is going to contain all of those different pizzas with their titles as well as the pizza names. So the titles really reflect those PNG files. That's important because that's what we're trying to get. So into images, pizzas, and then we're going to take that image title. So let's now get those in data points and display them and send them to our checkout page. So let's open up our pizza page here. And now just create this piece here for every single one of our pizzas. So here what we can do is we can use an add keyword to make this again a little bit of code. And now this for each will go through every single pizza inside of our collection called model.fake and let me enter this fake pizza db. Okay, and now what is it that we want to do inside of it? Well, inside of the for each loop, we want to create this div. Actually, we want to create this entire div. So let me put that even in a level higher like this. And this entire div, which we had created, so including the for each loop, <laughs> like this. So this entire div should now be created each time that we have an item inside of our fake pizza DB. So now the source obviously needs to be changed. So the source will now be our image path. So add image path. Let me see, did we create the image path? I think we didn't. So we need to create that for each item. So for each, and let me see, did we create it inside of this file? I think we didn't. So let's just do that. Let's create a image path is going to be inside of images slash pizzas. And then it's just going to be the pizza dot image title plus the dot PNG keyword. So now we can use this image path here. Now this obviously is C sharp code, so we need to finish it with a semicolon. So now let's see if any of this is even working. So if it now did create a bunch of pizzas for us, so let's go over to our pizzas page, and there we are, get this pizza, and each of them has a width of four columns. But as it seems, I'm not doing it correctly with the image path yet, so let me check what the problem here is. Actually, I'm just missing well, I need to assign it as a string, but at the same time, I need to use the add annotation here so that it actually uses this image path here. So now let's run it again and see if it's going to assign those images properly. So we go over to our pizzas and there we are. So as it seems, I just have a typo here for my first pizza name because there it doesn't find the pizza or it doesn't want to display the pizza. So I can go over here and see if I wrote this name properly, Margarita. So I was missing the R. So you see what I entered manually just didn't seem to work. So if you see that any of the images doesn't appear, it probably has to do with you not using the right image name or image title. So here we have all of, of our predefined pizzas and we have the buttons just underneath them. And when we click on them, it sends us over here, even though you see it doesn't display it correctly yet. So this is just the default text that we have here. So let's make sure that this is also fixed. So now we need to use the ASP root for that. What is the ASP root? Well, the ASP root attribute is used for creating a URL linking directly to a named root, which means that we can accomplish the same result as with the redirect to page method without using it but just with a link. So this is done by adding after the ASP page here, a little bit of code, let me add that here, which will be the ASP root. And the ASP root, you use it with ASP root minus, then the property name equals property value. Okay, so in our case, what that will mean is we 
set the let me actually put it into a separate line so it will be a little more readable so the asp root for the image title will be the pizza dot image title and then i want to add another asp root and this one will be the pizza price will be pizza or add pizza dot final price okay so let me also put that in a different line so what this allows us to do is to directly link something in our html code so to speak using the asp root now let's go ahead and see if this is going to work because we're passing the image title and the final price now and let's go over to our pizzas get the bolognese pizza and we see the bolognese so your order for the custom pizza is ready the price for your order is five euros so quite a cheap margarita pizza the conform order also works so that's brilliant now you could of course go ahead and instead of saying custom pizza that you display on your checkout page you could rename that to the pizza image title name or something like that but overall you see that our application works flawlessly now it doesn't look great i know but this is not what this is about this is just about you understanding how the general flow of an asp razor application works and you saw how to set everything up step by step so let's go over to pizzas and we can see all of our pizzas we see our great selection of pizzas now you could obviously optimize the distance here as i said this is not to win a design contest then we'll go to try now here we can go ahead and create our custom pizza and give it a name so let's call it tuna pineapple this sounds actually quite disgusting but if you add gorgonzola to it then it's actually quite interesting i can recommend it <laughs> So here, tuna, pineapple, craziness, like so, and order my pizza. And your order for the tuna, pineapple, craziness pizza is ready. The total price for your order will be 13 euros. Now, my pizza is very specific, so that's why it created, well, gave me this specific image here. Now, you could write some logic that it would then use the details that the user entered in here in order to then go ahead and adjust the image that is displayed but yeah that's pretty much it so now you see how to create a little application now you could obviously put it online and then obviously what needs to to still add some additional information like, such as to actually send the user for example to paypal to then purchase the item and then wait for the paypal request and then once the paypal request comes back and it worked out then you can go ahead and do the payment but that would be done using apis hey it's jenik again let me take over real quick and let's extend that beautiful application a little bit further so as you may have noticed when we create a pizza and we click on try now or we just take that margarita pizza here and click on confirm order then we get directed or redirected to that thank you page right here but in a real world application such an order needs to get saved anywhere, right? Because right now the order is gone for like ever and no one even noticed. So let's go ahead and add something really nice. Let's add an SQL database to this application so that we can save the orders in a very, very simple way. Okay, so this is just for introducing SQL databases or entity framework core in this course. Later on, we will for sure talk about this in detail. So this is really just to get you started with Entity Framework Core. We will build everything now from scratch. It's pretty easy. It's very simple to set up. So I would say let's just get started. Go to our application. And as I said, don't get confused. Later on, we will talk about that really in detail. 
This is our current pizza model that we have. It has an image title, it has a name, it has a price and so on. For our database entries, we will create another model, which is a pizza order model, for example, and it will simply contain the pizza name and the base price. Okay, that's enough. Because we can shorten it a little bit up, because these are really many fields here and we have an image title here, we really don't need that in our database. So let's simply add the name and the base price and you can go on from there. But I really want to show you how how to create a brand new model which we can add to our database why we can do that and you can extend it on your own from there so let's go ahead to our models folder on the right side click on add click on class and let's add a new class and let's call this one pizza order you don't really have to add the model syntax so you don't need to say pizzas model you can simply say pizza for example but that's just Make, for making things clear a little bit to you. So this is simply called a model right here, but we don't really need to add that model syntax. We can simply say pizza order, and this is a pizza order model, right? Okay, so let's call it pizza order for now. Let's click on add. If you have ever worked with an SQL database before, you may know that we definitely need a so-called primary key, which is for simply identifying a single object in a database. So imagine if you have 1000 orders in the database, each one needs a unique identifier and that's the so-called primary key. What is it in C sharp? Pretty simple. Let's create a property, write prop, press tap tap, int id, that's it, right? So it's a simple integer id, which is always ongoing. So if you have an order and that one gets id 10, you will never ever have again a pizza order with id 10 because it's absolutely unique. All right, so this is what we really need. Let's extend it a little bit more. Let's add another one, prop string pizza name. And we can add another one, prop float base price. There we go. So this is a very abstract, a minimal version of a pizza order, right? We could have something like phone number, client name or order name, something like this, so that you know who ordered the pizza, right? But this is really just for getting you started in setting up an entire database. So this is the minimal version that we need of a pizza order. Let's leave it as it is right now. We don't need to add anything else. Don't forget to check out our ASP.NET 6 full course. In over 13 hours of content, including quizzes and challenges, you will build real world projects, including handouts and support. We will also dive deep into topics like MVC pattern, Blazor server, RESTful API development, authorization and authentication and entity framework. You will become a true ASP.NET rockstar. So wait no longer and enroll right now. You can find the link in the description below. Now let's move on and create our application database context. In simple words, this is the way how we can really access our SQL database. So you will see that just in a minute. Let's go ahead and create a new folder in our project. Right click, add new folder and call the folder data. In that folder, create a new C sharp class and call the class application db context. We first have to import and install some NuGet packages. So let's move on to tools, NuGet package manager, and then manage NuGet packages for solution. Click on browse and now search for entity framework core. There we go. Now we have to install three packages in total. First of all, entity framework core. Let's install that. Then go ahead and install the SQL server so that we can use it connection string and so on in order to connect to our database. And we also have to update our database and this is why we need the tools package. We can find that when we scroll a little bit down or we search for entity framework core dot tools. Let's go ahead. Microsoft entity framework tools, right? We need to install that so that we can really update and create our database from the package manager console here in Visual Studio. That's amazing. All right, now let's close the NuGet package manager here and we are good to go. This is everything we needed to import. Now let's bring that into our new class application db context. Go to the very top, call using 
microsoft.entityFrameworkCore. Now that we have that imported, we can inherit the application DB context from the base class DB context. There we go. Now let's go ahead and create the so called DB set. Write prop, this is a property for sure. Int, we change that to DB set. Just imagine this is a table inside of our database, right? And the type of this table of this so-called set is type of pizza order. We don't have that imported yet. So hold the cursor above this, show potential fixes, and let's import Razor Pizzeria model namespace right here, right? And let's call that pizza orders, or we can even simpler call it orders, but that's fine. We can call it pizza orders. That's how the table in our SQL database will be named, right? We will see this just in a minute. And as I said, we will really get through this in detail later on. So let's just continue and bring our database to life, right? So we need to add another thing, which is really, really important. We need to add a constructor. So write down CTOR, tap tap, this is a constructor. And in order to make really use of it, first of all, please don't forget that we need to call the base constructor because right now we are inherited, right? So application DB context is inherited and we should really not miss the constructor of the DB context or our application. However, the database will not work. So let's call the base constructor. This is simple inheritance, right? Okay, public application DB context. And now as a parameter inside of that constructor, except db context options there we go of type application db context so this is how we will configure later on the connection string let me bring that down into the next line of code and add a nice name here let's call it options there we go this is how a constructor should look like right now so we have that constructor application db context and then we have the parameter application db context here from the db context options so there in this options we will define the connection string so that we say hey please create or connect to this database let's save this because we're done right now our new database will have one table with all the pizza orders right now let's go ahead and go to our app settings.json and now let's add our connection string simply create a new connection string option here. Let's call it default connection. Now let's find out what your connection string is. Go to view, go to SQL Server Object Explorer. And by default, when you install Visual Studio, you will also have an SQL Server installed. This is what I'm talking about. So click on that and copy what's the name of the server. Now, please notice that I have by default one backslash in the name, but since this needs to get escaped, it got converted into two backslashes, right? So, all right, just for you to see how this should look like, now I will copy that and remove it again. The default connection string consists of many attributes, but some of them are really necessary. First one is server. Server is equals to local DB MS SQL local DB, right? Now add a semicolon and now let's add the database name we want to connect to. And if we don't have a database with that name, we will create a database with that name. So database, you can write now or you can call it now as you like database, for example, pizza app, right? Add a semicolon and we are now good to go. Okay, so this is a very minimalistic connection string. As I said, it's just for getting you started. Now we are done here. This is the property that we want to read from our program.cs so that we can really get the value of the default connection. And this is where we will connect or how we will connect to our database. Now in order to do this, we go to a program.cs right here. Before we add the first service at Razor Pages, we will now add our database, the app application DB context, and configure it in that way that it will connect to the connection string that we have just created. So let's go ahead and call builder dot services dot add db context. There we go. Of type application db context. Right, this is the one that we have created right here. And this one contains the pizza orders table. So let's copy the name. We will have to import the namespace, but that's not a problem. Let's go ahead, hit control dot, and you can see using Razor Pizzeria data. And 
Now we can also add another namespace using Microsoft Microsoft, there we go, dot entity framework call. We will also need that one. Now add DB context right here. Let's add the braces. And now let's configure the options. So let's go ahead and say options goes to, there we go, like this. And inside of that options, we will now say options dot use SQL server. We can only call use SQL server when we have that SQL NuGet package installed what we did in the beginning. So everything should work now for you. Use SQL server. Now we open the braces and say builder dot configuration, right? This will lead us to the app settings. And now let's go ahead and say dot get connection string. And the connection string is bound to the name default connection here. So let's write that down. Sorry, as a string for sure. There we go. Now I would just close the SQL server object explorer real quick so that you can see a little bit more code. There we go. And we don't have to do anything else, right? So this will add a new service to our program or to our container, which is actually an application DB context. So in simple words, he will try to use an SQL server and connect to the default connection. So he will try to connect to this database. So we're nearly done completing our database setup. Let's go ahead, we need to call two comments in order to make everything run. Go ahead to tools, new get package manager and open the package manager console. Now every time we change something in our database setup, let me just explain that real quick. Let's go to the application DB context, right? Because this is how our database will look like. And if we change something right here, or if we change the pizza order, right? Let's go ahead. If we, for example, add the phone number or contact or whatever, we have to change our database, right? Because we added the pizza order and that one is currently as a model in our database. And if we change it here, we need to change it in our database too. So as soon as the database schema changes, we need to update our database. And this is called a migration. So let's create our first migration because we haven't created one yet. So we need to tell the system that our database has now a pizza order, right? So go to the package manager console and call add minus migration, like added pizza order. There we go. Let's hit enter and it should create a migration file now. And you can see some SQL code inside of this. Right now he's simply containing because I just forget something. Let's go to application DB context and inside of our base constructor, we also have to use the options, right? This is where we even call the base constructor. So just a small copy paste mistake here. All right, so now it's configured. Let's run the comment at migration at pizza order again. And now you will see the build succeeded. That's fine. And now it will open a migration file here. Right, so this is a real file. You can find that on the right side in the migrations folder now. Let's take a look. A migration consists of two methods. One is the up method. So let's say when we run that migration, right now we did not change the database, right? This is just like an open task. So we really need to run that migration. We have just created it, but we did not execute it. So let's take a look. The up method will create a new table, pizza order, and we have some columns inside there, ID, pizza name, and base price. And if we go back, like in Git version control, then we have a down method and it will drop the table. So we can simply switch between migrations, move on, move on, move on, or maybe go a step back. And this is how we can simply understand how the database evolved over time. All right. So as I said, we really will talk about this in detail later on. However, this is called a migration. Now this one is open. This is an open migration. We did not yet run it. We don't have a database. We don't have a pizza order table right now. So let's do the final step, let's create the database, simply run update minus database, and this will execute all open migrations. Perfect. If you can see that done, everything has worked as intended. Now let's try to check our database. Go ahead to view SQL server object explorer. Now we're in our server. Let's hit refresh open the server, open database, and you can see our pizza app database is right here. Now let's open that one up, 
go into tables and as you can see our pizza order table is here make a right click on it view data and now you can see we don't have any values in the database saved right now because that's not what we did yet but we have the structure so id pizza name base price that's amazing so now let's go ahead and add a new order to our database in the moment a customer orders a pizza now let's go ahead and add some real orders to our database in the moment when the client well orders a pizza so go to pages go to our checkout cshtml cs file because right here after creating a pizza or clicking on a pre-existing pizza we will get to the checkout page and right here we have the pizza name and pizza price so this is everything we need in order to save it to the database right so let's go ahead and do that real quick first of all the main question is and you will need that definitely in every application that we that you will create an ASP.NET call how can you access the database from here because we cannot call application to be context.safe or something else we need to make use of a very very important system here in ASP.NET Core and it's called dependency injection what does that mean it's pretty simple once you understand how it works in detail let's go ahead and open our program.cs right before we built the application which is happening here in line 14 where we uh, hit app builder.build right before that uh, method we can see that we add some services and every service that we add in our application will be provided in the dependency injection so as you can see here we have the services and to the services we add a db context so what it means is that we can use the dependency injection to get the db context right so we add it as a service and the dependency injection will give it to us so that we can use it how does that work pretty simple in case we want to use the dependency injection in our custom class for example or in our custom controller or whatever we simply create a constructor so let's go ahead create a constructor ctor now every service that you want to use will get injected in the constructor as soon as you write it here so let's go ahead and say we want to make use of an application db context don't forget to add the razor pizzeria data namespace application db context let's call it context and now let's save this context that we get from the dependency injection let's save this into a private read only application db context and let's call it context right notice the underscore this is because the variable is private and let's assign the private variable with the value of the dependency injection now we have the context and this context is our database let's go ahead and create a new model and save it into our database so our table is of type pizza order so let's create a new pizza order pizza order make sure to import the namespace pizza order equals to new pizza order pizza order dot name pizza name equals to pizza name right it's the one you can find right here and you also have the pizza price so let's go ahead pizza order pizza name pizza order there we go sorry pizza price or base price equals to pizza price there we go and now we want to take this pizza order here and save it into our database we only need two method calls for this let's grab our context that we have just created and go to the pizza orders table now call a method called add so add something to our database pizza orders table please add the pizza order and now very important please notice that every time you modify the database you add something you delete something you modify a value you always have to save the database call context.save changes there's also an async version of the most of these methods but we will get to this later on right so let's add our pizza into the database or the pizza order and then save the database perfect let's go ahead and give it a try go to our database pizza order here hit uh, uh, refresh right now it's nothing inside that's totally correct for sure and I also want to say something real quick we don't assign an ID here so pizza order dot ID we don't have to fill that out because entity framework will automatically create a primary key and ID is our primary key right here so we don't have to care about that 
All right, so let's save it and now let's visit our application. Let's order a margarita pizza, get this pizza. And in a moment, we confirm the order. Thank you for ordering. We will now have that in our database. So let's go ahead to our application. Let's go to pizza order and update or refresh the entries. And as you can see, pizza margarita base price four. So for sure, I tried it several times before. This is why the ID is six. For you, it might be one, right? And now let's create a custom pizza. Pizza, try now. Let's call it Cheesy Roni. Let's add cheese and pepperoni. There we go. Check for the price. Price is four. Cheesy Roni, confirm. Take a look at the database. Refresh. And you can see cheesy roni right so now we have saved something into our database so this data is persisted now when we shut down the application and start it again we still have our pizzas saved in the database now let's extend that even a little bit further and let's add an overview of all the orders that we have in our application into our front end so that we can see all orders when we click on orders in the navigation bar we will need to add that and afterwards we are done. Then you have learned how you can create a complete application also using SQL database and entity framework core so that you can save and read persistent data. All right, so now let's go ahead and add another page to our application. So click on pages, right click, add razor page. Let's call the razor page orders. Click on add. And now let's first of all add it to our navigation bar. So let me really quick uh, close that SQL Server Explorer here. We don't need it anymore. Let's go to the shared folder and click on layout. Let me zoom a little bit out and now let's adjust it a little bit. When we scroll to the very bottom, we can see that privacy page here. Let's get rid of this completely. We don't need it. Let's save it. Let's scroll a little bit up and then we have the privacy here. Let's adjust this to slash orders and set the name to orders too. So let's save it. Let's take a look at the application. As you can see in the navigation, we have now orders. Let's click on that and we will get to an empty page. That's fine. So in the end, we will have home, pizza and orders. Later on, because the orders should not be visible for everyone, right? They should only be visible for the manager of the pizzeria, for example. Later on in this course, we will completely check out the entire topic of authorization and authentication. So I'm talking about an identity management system with users and roles. And to explain it in the best way possible, we will create a complete invoice management system for companies. Now let's just real quick move into our order CSHTML CS and let's think about of what data we need in our view. So what do we really want to display? I think about displaying a small table styled with bootstrap, which is simply displaying all the orders that we have in our database. So we need a list of all pizza orders from our database. Let's first of all create that list, public list, type of pizza order we need to import that namespace control dot using razor pizzeria model there we go and then we say pizza orders equals to new list of pizza order so it's empty right now okay and then in on get we go to our context and then grab all the orders from the database so if you want to have the context you have to use the dependency injection and you can use the dependency injection by creating a constructor. So let's again, CTOR constructor. Let's create a private read only application DB context, context. There we go. Import the namespace and the constructor take the application DB context. Context. Let's set the value. Now we can make use of our context in on get. Let's grab all the information that we really need. So we simply need all open orders or all orders in general. So let's go ahead and say pizza orders equals to now really pay attention to that context. We go into our database. Let's move into our pizza orders table and let's 
take them all, the entire list, and let's make a list out of it to list, right? Pizza orders to list. Now we are done. We have that. We don't need to save here because we're simply reading data. You only have to save if you are modifying data. So adding, deleting, updating, right? Pizza order. And now let's move into our orders CSHTML. You can see we're using the orders model here. So let's real quick create some HTML markup. Let's go ahead and create an H3, for example, call it orders. Let's add some nice space. This HR is a very thin, long line. And now let's create a table. We can pretty easily do that. Go ahead and create a table like this. Add a style class from Bootstrap. Let's call it table. Now let's add a T hat, which is a table header. And inside that T hat, we add the first table row, which is actually the head. We'll see that in a second. Let's go ahead and the first one is, for example, the ID. You can really create it as you need, but I want to give you a simple template, right? So now let's get that out. ID, our pizza name, and we have the price, for example, right? So let's take a look real quick in order to see what's happening in the front end. So let's build the application and take a look. As you can see, we now have bootstrap table, ID, pizza name and price. This is what we have created so far. You can see the orders header and you the HR thin line I'm talking about. And now let's bring in the data here. Go ahead and create a T body right under the T head. So let's go ahead T body. There we go. And inside that we have a TR table row. And inside of that table row, there is a data of a specific order. So let's just real quick above this, create a loop at for each, let's write a for each loop, var order in model dot pizza orders. This will make it possible for us to create a table row inside of our for each loop. And now inside that row, we have some table data fields for each header field. So this one is ID, this one is name, and this one is the price, right? So this is matching with the structure of this one. ID, pizza name, price, ID, pizza name, price. So let's insert the data at order.id. It's really pretty straightforward. Once you get the system, it's absolutely handy and easy to create incredible huge web applications. ID, pizza name and order dot base price. There we go. Let's save it and take a look again. Now you should already see our information from the database. So now you can create data and now you can read data. Amazing. So this is how you can integrate a SQL database using Entity Framework Core from scratch so that you can read and write data. So now let's just add some nice visual stuff to our pizza pitch to spice it up a little bit. And then we have finished this application. Let's add a nice visual effect. Go to our pizza page and these blue buttons, we should really adjust them and add a nice little hover effect to make it a little bit more eye catchy. So let's move to our pizza page, which is pizza.cshtml. And in or for each loop here, we are looping through all the fake pizza database here in order to show all of the information about all the pizzas. So let's go ahead and we have that A tag here and this A tag is handling, well, the process of redirecting us to the checkout page. So let's just combine this. So copy the image tag here, copy that one. And let's go to the A tag. And here where we have the get this pizza, let me just bring that into the next line of code. There we go. Inside of that A tag, let's just get rid of the get this pizza and let's simply add the image tag we have just copied, right? Now go ahead to the A tag and remove the button and button primary. We can also remove the margin top right now. Let's save it. Let's take a look at our application. When we click on Margarita, for example, it should still work because we did not change any of the routing data. So pizza is ready, it's margarita, right? So this is absolutely not a problem. Meat feast, there we go. And then we can confer uh, confirm the order, etc. And we can still create our own pizza. Let's give it a try. Perfect. So now to end this, let's simply add a nice visual effect. For this, we will create a custom CSS class. Pretty easy. Let's go to our project. 
Let's go to www root CSS site.css. You can for sure create a custom new CSS file, but we will extend it here as we did before. Let's go ahead and say dot pizza minus IMG. And we only want to assign some new effects when we hover. So make a colon and then say hover, not after hover. There we go. And now let's write some nice effects. Transform colon scale 1.05 just to make it a little bit bigger when we hover right so now don't forget to assign that class pizza img go to pizza html and now here at our a tag let's add class again class equals to pizza minus img don't add it to the image directly because it's wrapped with the a tag so add it to the a tag let's save it and visit our application and sometimes when you change CSS styling code, you have to refresh the page and clear the cache. So press Ctrl F5. Now let's see if everything is working. When I hover, we got a nice small visual effect. This is really important in web development. It's important to drive the attention of the user. This looks pretty nice and I'm pretty happy with that now. So amazing. Yeah, now we are finished with our application. You have achieved something really nice because you have now learned an entirely new system which is Razor Pages and you have built a complete application including form data, saving some elements to a database and much much more even styling, right? So we now have reached the end of this few free hours of the complete ASP.NET 6 course. Make sure to check the link to the full course in the description below. And if you're new to the channel or haven't subscribed already, subscribe and like the video right now to no longer miss any high quality programming content. Write a comment below and tell us if you like the video, if you have any questions or any wishes for new content. So thanks for watching and see you next time.